Technically, uh, my name is Kirti Shah. Uh, I am. Uh, I work with the Habitat Forum, and I have been sort of curating this uh, series of webinars that we are doing for last one year. Uh, so, welcome to fifty-second event of the webinar series called Rethinking City or Rethinking Indian City, we have been anchoring for last one year. Uh, as you probably know, we started last June and have covered many urban themes from slums to mobility, to governance, to water, to technology, to sanitation, to climate change, to economic growth and sustainability. We had even a webinar on Gandhi and city. We have had over 300 urban experts, professionals and uh, specialists share their ideas, thoughts, views, and perspectives on better planning, management, and development of our cities. And we have had more than 50 partners, local and international, in organizing this highly educative uh, webinars. Let me <clears throat> tell you briefly why we are doing this. What is the purpose? And what is sought to be achieved by doing this? Something we have been doing with a large number of people for a year. The webinar series is an integral part and feeds into an initiative in half and partners have launched last year called City URI, Citizen Urban Initiative. It is a multi-level and multidisciplinary societal effort to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the complex urban challenge. It's a three-part task. First, reassessing India's urban challenge. Second, rethinking Indian city. And three, reformulating response in the context of the country's national development challenges, not only urban challenges. This is in response to a recognition that our cities are not in good health and India's urban systems are faltering in many respects, be that environment or governance of finance, of planning, or equitable growth or sustainable development. The cities as they are, as they grow and develop, seem to convey that things are not what they should be and need an urgent re-see, rethink, and react in policy, programs, institutions, and investment. There is an unspoken, unseen, and unarticulated silent emergency, and the missing urgency and creativity in response is causing harm in economic, environmental, and human terms. With the COVID pandemic opening many fault lines in our economy, in our society, and our ways of living, and the climate change knocking on the door, both the short-term problem solving and long-term planning must reckon with the need for a major change in how we see, how we plan, and how we develop in our, our cities. With the cities contributing nearly 65% to the national GDP already, 
And the urban population growth estimates suggesting 820 million people in the cities by 2050. In just 30 more years, India could ill afford underperformance in addressing the complex urban challenge. The stakes, the stakes are indeed high. With that quality of living environment of millions of people or the national dream of a $5 trillion economy. With all these cities need to be rethought and reorganized. That is not to say that Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, Smart Cities Program, Amrit, and the toilet mission do not matter or have not helped. They have. The point is that the response to the challenge needs much more than what is on offer a paradigm shift in mindset and thinking out of box in search of solutions. This webinar is therefore are meant to open the much needed societal dialogue on how we handle urbanization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of economic growth minus the exploitative instinct and damaging traits such as natural resource depletion and destruction and carbon footprint. The goal is to aim for and work towards economically productive, socially just, politically participatory, environmentally sustainable, culturally vibrant, technologically adaptive, and people-centric cities. These are the seven goals we're talking about. This damage is, is a demanding challenge and a daunting task, especially as our energy and resources are limited. We as individuals, organizations, and institutions tend to do what we know to do and what is doable. Time also comes where we must do what is required to be done. And we believe the urban challenge falls in the later category. So that is my, my introductory statement in terms of what are we doing and why are we doing. And before we start, it's uh, my honor to introduce two of the anchors. Uh, first is uh, Punamji. She is an architect, building conservation consultant, researcher and writer with three decades of domestic and international experience. She is a founding director of the Goa Bay Studio, Arkinova and Iran's, and she's also a co-founder of Goa Heritage Action Group. She is one of the two anchors managing webinar today. Vinay Khane is a practicing urban design and city planner in Los Angeles, USA. He's adjunct associate professor of urbanism at University of Southern California and coordinator of the India Netherlands based knowledge platform, My Livable City. He's, he's, he's author and editor of numerous books. So with this introductory statement, I hand this over to two anchors. Thank you very much to anchors and thank you very much this versatile panel that we have today. Thank you very much. So to begin, good morning. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, KTG. It's a pleasure to be here to address the overarching theme we conceive these three part series. And now, today, we are talking about my slides. Sorry, my slides are not moving. It will move. You can just.
India's World Heritage Cities and Living Sites for Wallace. In the month of May, when we were conceptualizing this session, little did we know that we coincide with the 44th session of World Heritage Committee. India successfully got two more sites inscribed, taking the total. I'm having some trouble. Uh, one second, please. The Taking the total to 40. Kakatiya Rudreshwara Ranapa Temple is the first WHS and newly formed state of Telangana. In the executive summary, along with the architectural features, it mentions located at the foothills of a forested area amidst agriculture fields close to the shores of Ramapa Cheruva, a Kakatiya built reservoir. The choice of setting of the edifice followed the ideology and practice sanctioned in Dharmic texts that temples are to be constructed to form an integral part of natural setting, including hills, forests, springs, streams, lakes, catchment areas, and agricultural lands. And I thought to myself, wow, so finally, 12th century Indian traditional planning policy has been recognized to be of universal value. And then the devil in my ear whispered, so will the 21st century planners of the village and the conservation management plan of the temple honor this value? The site listed this year is also Dolabi, second one. Harappan city, sited on the arid island of Kabir in state of Gujarat. Executive summary mentioned, amongst other salient features, that it was occupied between 3000 and 1500 BC common era and had a sophisticated water management system that demonstrates the ingenuity of Gholavira people in the struggle to survive and thrive in a harsh environment. What the summary doesn't mention is that Gholavira residents were probably the first climate migrants and perhaps are the ancestral settlers along the rivers Kanga and Yamuna in the subcontinent. In 2017, on our visit, we witnessed some harsh conditions firsthand, as water table is blackish. And today, in the midst of climate crisis, I wonder how many of our living sites will be rendered archaeological, like this one, in the next 100 years. Then came the news, Liverpool losing its WHS status. Could WHS old go on the next? The last few weeks sure have made us realize beyond all doubts the WHS Kukariko, the site of churches and convents of Old Goa, inscribed in 1986 with seven select monuments mentioned, the site is indeed under threat. This, while the site earns for the state by tourism through an organized yearly and month long every day for religious veneration of St. Francis Xavier who died on 3rd December 1552 and found his final resting place in the Basilica of Form Jason in 1624. The built fabric of Basilica, Basilica in itself is now endangered. The church was de-plastered in 1956 as a step towards stylistic representation as was then popular in Iberia. In 1961, when the Union of India took over, an exposed laterite Basilica with basalt Stone facade was accepted as the norm, and the nine plaster basilica was forgotten. Sixty years of torrential rains of Goa have battered and severely eroded and exposed laterite masonry, rendering it vulnerable. The people of Goa, along with the church, are demanding ASR to restore the building urgently. But the unresolved clash of ownership between the church and the legislated agency, the ASR, is resulting in a stalemate while Basilica's built fabric continues to degrade. The village of Say Old Goa is under rampant, insensitive urban development. The WHS can further lose its cohesiveness as the curtilages of the monuments 
have not been marked on any statutory plan prepared by the state government. And this is an invisible threat to the site. While on paper, adequate legislation exists to check the threats, a lack of implementation on ground in form of conservation management plan for each of the seven listed monuments and the participation of all, all stakeholders is leading to severe erosion of statement of significance, embedded values, and the related outstanding universal values of the site. While the state planning policy remains a vital instrument to ensure safeguarding of this very valuable archaeological site, the obliteration of several of the monuments from the regional plan of 2021, from the recently formulated Coastal Resolve Management Plan, and from the State Climate Policy Plan, is telling of its deliberate attack on the legacy of the past. The ASI has a dedicated Goa circle, but still appears to be ineffective in implementing the Answer Act 2020 amendments. The 73rd, 74th Constitutional Amendments 1992 have made planning a down the top process with people's participation through an elected Gram Panchayat municipal body and has manifested itself in the form of several protests against the ongoing desecrations at the site in form of illegal construction, sanctioned by the state government agencies, colluding together to serve their political masters. The illegality perhaps may go by changing the human-made laws, but isn't it highly irresponsible to build in the lowest line area of the village within the 50 meters of the bank of a tidal river when we know the sea levels are rising? Concerned by the multitude of unforeseen difficulties facing World Heritage Cities, a historic urban landscape approach has been discussed since 2011, where the imperatives of urbanism are being informed and deliberated to ensure continuity with place identity with new development. This session does ask, how can Heritage, conservation, and urbanism work together towards bigger common socioeconomic goals. How can Indian heritage cities contribute to the ongoing dialogue on generating imperatives of conservation? How can conservation become an instrument for shaping a livable, resilient city? What role can the civic society and the municipal institutes play in this endeavor? And thus, we have today with us eight panelists who shall share their thoughts for eight minutes each to be followed by an anchor discussion for about 30 minutes please do use q a box at the bottom of your queries for your queries is the name of the speaker to whom to address it. and now let me introduce our first speaker professor rana pbc professor has been rana ji is Professor of Cultural, Landscape and Heritage Studies, 1998 to 2016, and Head of the Department of Geography, Institute of Science, Panaras Hindu University, from 2013 to 15. He is the President of Asian Cultural Landscape Association, Chief Coordinator, ICOMOS NSC Cultural Landscapes, and expert and AC member of ICOMOS ISC place of religion and rituals. His publications include 320 papers, 43 books, anthologies on these subjects, including Banaras, Making of the Indian Heritage City, and Sacred Scapes of Pilgrimage Landscapes, 2011. His forthcoming in 22, co-edited three anthologies from Springer Nature International Publishing include placemaking and cultural landscapes. Sacred Heritage and Pilgrimages in Cities, and the Indian Urban Landscapes Cultural Representation and Global Message. Over to you, Ranaji.
Okay, can you listen me? I am audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Namaste to everybody. And uh, so nice of you and uh, that you people have invited me, especially Poonamji and Vinayakji for this uh, presentation. So I'm going to present the case of Varanasi in a very nutshell what uh, is going on and taking only one example, and that is the Vichanath uh, Temple Corridor, which is Prime Minister especially dream that this city should be grown like that. So that idea I'm going to emphasize, not the, all the aspects. And you might be knowing that uh, already some of the aspects of the city like uh, music, and uh, now arts in the Tibetan music already the city of creative uh, art, music you consider, and the Ram Lila in, under the intangible heritage. But it's still, the main city has not been properly uh, inscribed in the world at the list. Okay, so that's giving you the idea. Okay, the city is well known for its, uh, you know, typical metaphysical representation. So here in the map, you can see that uh, uh, the city, this yellow portion, upper side Varana, lower side Yasi, and that's why the name is considered to be the uh, Varan city. Now, two aspects are very important. The one aspect is that unique heart, the riverfront uh, landscape that you start from Asigar going to Adikesha, covering about seven kilometers. It has a, a 84 stairways set according to the historical sources, at least we can say 12th century. And that 84 having some significance related to metaphysical representation, according to Hindu cosmological frame, we say that. 8.4 million organic species in the cosmos and the soul has to move like that. This way that has been set in the manner that if you can take holy tip on all the ghats, the sequence as described and ordained in the sastras, then you can get a liberation from this world. This is the idea. And this way that becomes very unique in a sense. We can add some other important aspect how scientifically we can try to see its landscape setting. So we have tried to understand the curvature, then sunrise at particular point, then how it is going to be half the way exactly the turning that is a 45 degree up, 45 degree down. So this way some of the scientific aspects also related to this and we have done that, what is called a cosmic geometry. So this is the first aspect. Second aspect related to this is, this is full of huge number, nobody can say that exactly how many temples according to historical sources. Already 1190, 1190, we have already plotted and prepared maps for all this. That took 40 years of learning. And then that was a collaborative effort. Binagji also part of that one. So the thing is that uh, this much of number of temple and each having its own distinct quality. And then they have different type of typology and character. And which is the nexus? The nexus point is called a Vishwanatha, Visheshwara, Visheshwara in more sense, vice versa, and in more popular way that is called Vishwanatha. So I will try to show you some of those aspects related to this. The other aspects related to this, this is unique city that it has preserved during last, uh, you can say 500 years, at least the pilgrimage journey. According to historical sources, we find 54 such journeys. But uh, after 13th century, we can find only five are the most important journeys. Of course, other journeys are also going on. So you see in this particular picture, the left-hand side is that uh, pictorial frame. There is a theoretical construction that I, how the five brass elements that making the uh, life phenomena, Panchabhuta. And then how that is really converted based on the GPS map that how it is exists in the lines. We find it very close symmetry, you can see very easily. And one great surprising thing, what we, we have done in 1995, first time, and published in Science Journal, that the outer ring is exact circle, exact 100%. They have marked the footpath is running here and there, but 96 points, our signs are exactly on the circle. 
That is the beauty of that, you know, how they have tried to put the whole cosmic frame. So there is a center close to Vishnu Temple, which is in today. And then the radial point is uh, called Delhi, not Delhi, don't confuse. Delhi is cosmic gate. And then you can draw a circle. So that we have tried to survey and plot, and then you find this is a unique thing. Still, that is not highlighted that uh, uh, in the UNESCO frame. So that is the other third part of this one. Historically, we say that this is the one of the ancient most living city in the world. Of course, three times we have destruction. That is a hard fact. And the story starts at least 1000 BC. So we have from soil phosphate analysis, chemical analysis, thorium analysis, that has been done. So that is more, you can say, archaeological. But on the seal, we find the image of Vishwanatha, and that's how we link the whole story. So that is started from 1000 BC and coming at different stages that one can see on the internet or my publications. The recent story starts that in first time in 2018, it has been thought that why not we develop the core area as a nexus point, uh, what you call nexus access Monday, and then we can link all the pilgrimage route and that can make the city as a cosmic city, what was already described in the ancient literature, especially you can say 12th century literature. So many things distorted. So the plan is we had to revive all those traditions like this, and that was Prime Minister's dream. This way, on March 8, 2019, the reconstruction work and plan prepared, and then it started. The position is you can say two sides of the contradictory story. Many people say, oh, it has lost the ancient culture, ancient buildings, ancient temples. Other side, they say, no, this is going to be a wonderful place for the pilgrimage tourism, it's spiritual tourism, and such a revival. So that is the two sides of the story. So I, I am telling you some, some aspect of it. Like you see, the story starts in this way. First site, which was described in the text, no way we can identify where it was, unknown before current era, seventh century current era. So that we think that was something like here, you can see number two, Rajya Mas, that is second level, seventh century to the 12th century. So where was the first, we can say about five kilometers north of that, according to geomagnetic survey. But no way we can say that where was the exact one. The so story is- Sorry, Ranaji, you will have to wind up. Oh, okay, okay. So quickly, seven, eight minutes. This way that how that different position is changed in the style. Then we find that uh, how the whole plan has been made like this. This is 2017. So we have plotted all the ancient temples and then try to see how it is going to be planned like this. And then how it is going to be in future. This is the plan going on. So this is the whole reconstruction, revival of the ancient city. So that from the Ganga River in the eastern side directly, now you follow the different lanes and then reach to the main temple of Vishwanath. That is the main perspective of that one to revive the ancient tradition. Of course, 280 houses are polished for this. That is another aspect of that social aspect. This is the plan that how it will look like. This is going on already in the process. The construction work like this way. The good thing is that uh, they have tried to survey and try to link to the process of consecration, what is called pranapatish. If some temple or shrine has been demolished here and there, or some destruction, then that has been re-established in a system that will fit to the pilgrimage system of this particular area. Okay, so how it looks like. So the earlier, the lower side, you can see what will be in the future. This way, that whole plan will be like this. So the simple thing, let me now just close it like that. The basic uh, hypothesis, or you can say the reason behind this is, this is based on the International Union of Conservation of Nature, spiritual world, human world, natural world, all together linked together and the center of this superimposition will be sacred religious sites. And that is the Vishwana temple will be the nexus, the core from where all this plan will be developed like this. So that is the whole thing after all this exercise. So let me close like this with this saying of uh, Vivekananda Ji, arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached.
This is the way the whole philosophic thing is going to be converted into the practical form with philosophy, society, and economy, and that will promote a special tourism, or you can say, pilgrimage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you so much, Ranaji. If you could just stop sharing the screen, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Amita Baig, who is the executive editor of World Monuments Fund India. She has over 30 years of experience in the conservation and preservation professions, uh, particularly in India's diverse cultural heritage, its management, and crafting roadmaps for future sustainability. She has worked in the Asian cultural region with UNESCO Asia Pacific and also with the Gulbenkian Foundation. She was one of the founder members of the Taj Mahal Conservation Collaborative, spending about a decade with them. Uh, she's published a wonderful book. I encourage you all to see it, Taj Mahal, Multiple Narratives, and another one on forts and palaces of India. Amita, it's great to have you. Stage is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for a very, very um, wonderful initiative. Uh, and I look forward to sharing my thoughts with you. Congratulations, especially to Poonam and Vinayak for uh, taking this whole initiative forward. I love the title of and the whole thrust of India's world heritage cities and living sites, because so much of what we do, I think, is about thinking on our feet and moving very quickly. Yeah, how do I get? Yeah, into. Um, addressing problems. I mean, historic cities in India have enormous challenges. They just barrel out of proportion. And sometimes I think as conservationists, we need to be able to um, be, stay abreast of these changes, to be able to adapt, because living cities, living heritage isn't static. Conservation tends to be static. And I think that's the move forward we need to make is we need to make get ourselves otherwise we're going to miss the boat because economic development is something that you know mr shah said is something we have to look at and jesselmer effectively is at the end of the gravy train of india's development story they're the last outpost in the west of india it was a city which came to which rose to its glory on the back of trade from the west to the east. But today it's the last point of development in India. So tourism was the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, Kakam's development thrusts was the Ganga Canal that was developed, the Indira Gandhi Canal that was developed along the western periphery of India. With that came water being pumped into the fort. And 20 years after the inauguration of the Indira Gandhi Canal, the fort just periodically collapsed. Bits of it collapsed, palaces collapsed, forts collapsed. And World Monuments Fund moved in and we said, okay, let's get at least the palace restored and do a complete study of how we were going to save this. The fact that came to light was nobody owned a single building except the Maharaval who refused to sign in, the Maharaja who refused to sign an agreement with the Archaeological Survey of India, who now protect it, but every other house is privately owned and they have no ownership papers. It's custom and usage. You can't disturb traditions like that. So no matter what regulatory mechanism you put into place, how much conservation we did, there's this whole initiative um, about, 2000, we started an initiative and Intact took it on to provide toilets for every house to prevent defecation in the Fort Mori. Well, you know, and, and that's where I need to say, I must say that we need to be dynamic because it was a great idea promoted and pushed by me, <laughs> especially saying this is such a great idea. Every single one of those houses became a hotel. Ten years, five years later, the Geological Survey of India in partnership with us did a report. Well, the whole fort is on a fault. 
we need to decongest. The project almost went belly up because suddenly conservation was at complete loggerheads with the community, which suddenly had unlimited water, sewage, sanitation, they could convert their every little square inch into a tourism destination. I was getting desperate until this initiative started sometime in 2011, just before it became a World Heritage Site. I love Jesselmer and look at the vested interest. It was a hotelier who built a hotel some 10 kilometers outside Jesselmer. And he rang me one day, he said, this is the most ghastly, filthy site I've ever been to. Can I intervene? And we said, of course, without any support from anyone, except I think the then secretary culture or the chief secretary Rajasthan, his initiative was to clean the fort. He gave every, all the youngsters, a peak cap, a t-shirt. He got a tiny little space in the fort and he set about weekend cleaning some 80 or 90 tons of garbage from here, from the hillside. I mean, from the Mori, the whole place was cleaned. And for the first time, the residents of Jesselmer actually had a sense of how it could be. They were shaped. And because he had engaged the younger people, um, there was a commitment now, not through all our conservation efforts, but through, and, and let's be honest, it's an economic incentive as well, but a commitment to work with people to bring the fort to a level where a couple of years later, it was became a World Heritage Site as part of the forts of Rajasthan. Initially, it had been thought that it wasn't in management terms up to the standards of World Heritage, but it was realized that you certainly couldn't have the forts of Rajasthan go through without Jesselman, so it was attached. But I want to particularly show you these two photographs. This lower one is possibly what we took when we started the project in about 2000. And this was a photograph I found literally last month. You can see here, here, and here, there is absolutely no control of construction because nobody knows who owns what. But now what is very sad is there no, there's no control of material. So your crenellated bastion has now gone. You have gray concrete houses, pink concrete blocks, something else coming up here. The very value and authenticity, the, the value of the site, its outstanding universal value is today radically compromised. So it raises the question of how engaged are we locally? What benefits accrued? And whether in fact conservation must find the middle path. And then I'm going to talk to you very briefly I think I have another four minutes or three minutes to talk to you about the most privileged monument in India. And having been privileged to spend close on 12 years at the site, it is without doubt the greatest privilege to do that. Um, it has also the luxury of having a 500 meter green belt around it. This was the result of a Supreme Court judgment of 1996 against the Mathura refinery, which came up in 60 kilometers away from Agra, north of Agra, um, and a series of judgments. So the Taj Mahal got a 500 meter green belt simultaneously. Look at it. It's absolutely perfect. It sits in this pristine greenery. 1.5 million people were run out of work as a result of the Supreme Court judgment, which closed down 435 industries. 4 million people affected indirectly. No industry could function in a 50 kilometer radius of what is popularly called the Taj Trapezium. So what happened? You know, all this happened. Closure was empirical. And then there's nothing, there's no economy. Of course, this is a historic thing when Shah Jahan had just finished building the Taj, off he went to Delhi, built Shah Jahan Abad and abandoned Agra. And it fell into a series of collapses, including um, when it got taken over by the British. But 
today when you it, it's your marketing the Taj Mahal to such an extraordinary level and the city around it is decaying and it, you know it is a stark contrast you have this super highway into Agra from Delhi effectively you can leave Delhi at seven o'clock in the morning be at the Taj Mahal for breakfast look at it and be back in Delhi for lunch but what of the rest of the city you have here signposts to the Agra fort, to the Fatehpur secret, you are embroiled in the city, which is, you know, I've watched it now for 20 plus years. Nothing ever actually happens. There are World Bank plans, Asian Development Bank plans, you name it, everybody's made a plan for Agra, it's happening. You get beautified roads up to the Taj. It now runs about four feet higher than the Taj Mahal itself because we keep layering over it. And the rest of the city just densifies at a very, you know, basic level. There are plans to put the, you know, smart city initiatives are taking place. But its impact is really on that one monument. And that I think, you know, Ultimately, I believe the future of Agra will depend on the commitment to address these multiple issues which beset it. We worked at Itma Dudawla for five years, putting, trying to get water into the uh, channels. There is no potable drinking water in 2019 in Agra. The residents of Agra are buying Agra water. There is no solid waste management. This photograph at the bottom was taken in 2018. And this is the most beautiful, privileged monument we have in India. So I think there's a lot to do with structural reform uh, and convergence while we save our world heritage cities because one without the other would be diminished. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amita. Indeed. Moving on to the next. Pratish Nanda is conservation architect and is India CEO for Aga Khan Trust for Culture. He heads the multidisciplinary ATPC team presently undertaking the two major urban conservation projects in India, the Nizamuddin Urban Renewable Initiative, Jali and the Heritage Park Conservation in Hyderabad. For AKTC, he was earlier responsible for Bhagi Babur restoration in 2002-6 in Kabul, Afghanistan, and the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb from 1999 to 2003. His publications include Delhi, the Built Heritage, a listing Delhi, Red Fort to Razina, Conservation of Historic Graveyard Scotland and Rethinking Conservation Humayun's Tomb. His awards include the Chisti India Harmony Award 2014 and the Eisenhower Fellowship 2007 and the Urban Hero titled by Prince Klaus Fund, Aga Khan Foundation International Scholarship. So nice of you to join us. I hope my seven minutes don't include this long introduction. No, it doesn't. You have the time. So I can switch on the timer now, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Poonam. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this incredible August company. Um, it's, um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know about all of these 52 seminars earlier or one would have tried to attend some of them, but uh, better late than never. Um, I, as Poonam has sort of introduced, uh, work for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and uh, we in India are right now doing two large urban conservation projects, uh, one at Humayun's tomb in Delhi and one at uh, the Qutub Shai tombs in Golconda in Hyderabad. So uh, I'm just going to show a few slides and, uh, you know, talk about some of the critical things that, uh, uh, that we've been able to um, to do in these uh, projects. Um, um, are those slides visible now? Um, I hope they are. Um, yes. Yeah. Stop. 
Sorry, I started from the last slide. Now only if it would move. <clears throat> so we um, we work uh, we work uh, in the 1970s. Uh, you know, His Highness the Aga Khan established uh, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and then later the program I work for, which is called the Aga Khan Historic Cities Program. And the thinking behind um, setting up these programs, and we work across 30 countries, has been that uh, what His Highness the Aga Khan uh, felt was well, just like education and uh, health and uh, all of these uh, you know, traditional develop, uh, parameters to measure development, he felt that uh, sometimes communities uh, can have social economic development, improve quality of life just through the cultural heritage that um, they are in ownership of or the cultural heritage that they uh, live uh, amidst. Um, this is um, this is a um, you know um, this is how the whole Nizamuddin Humayun's tomb area would have looked in the 19th century. It is a painting done by architect Manish Das, and as you can see, you know until the 19th century, this was this was uh, this was mostly you know you could see till the end of the horizon. It was a river, um, and along the banks of the river were just just like Agra, uh, a lot of uh, mausoleum. Um, this is my favorite slide. I'm sure um, every panelist on this, except possibly um, Dr. Singh, um, uh, has probably seen this because in um, in these two slides, one is able to capture uh, the garden restoration that we did at Humayun's tomb. And uh, this was the first ever privately undertaken conservation effort in India. It was also the first ever garden restoration uh, at any of our national monuments. And this was a gift of His Highness the Aga Khan on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of India's independence. So this is when, um, you know, when uh, uh, Poonam is talking about world heritage cities and so on. Uh, unfortunately, Humayun's tomb is not a city, but uh, but it was. It was the part of the earliest Mughal city in uh, India. And uh, when it was built in the, in the you know, mid 16th century, this was part of a very large necropolis. In 1993, this was designated a World Heritage Site. And during 1993, you could uh, get a World Heritage Site uh, done on the back of uh, two A4 size papers. I don't know what Shita thinks about that. Uh, but it was it was literally, um, as, as all of you probably know, it was literally two A4 size papers and one map that brought Homayun's tomb on the World Heritage list. Um, one of the conditions of Ecomos was restore the gardens, and that's when the Archaeological Survey of India approached us restored the, to restore this garden. And in in this picture, you can see you can see that cement is covering the waterfall. You can see the platform, uh, which would have been the royal tent, is broken. You can see Ashoka plantation. You can see neglect. You can see all of that. And this we were able to, uh, you know, fix. And this immediately led to a thousand percent increase in visitor numbers. And with that, uh, huge uh, revenue increase in ticket numbers and so on. And, you know, if you really want to justify how conservation can pay for itself, it's over here. Now, no other investment has this sort of rate of return. We came back to the site. We came back to the site. Uh, the Prime Minister of India then was also the Minister of Culture. He requested his Highness to do more work in India. We were offered 50 sites across the country. But we chose to come back here mainly because we thought our work at Homayun's tomb was incomplete. We thought we'd only done a garden restoration. We'd not worked on the buildings. We'd not created open green spaces big enough. And we had not worked with the local community. So. Um, it was because of the proximity of Hazrat Nizamuddin Basti, which is on the bottom left of the map, um, and uh, a very needy population that we chose to come back to Humayun's tomb rather than the 50 sites uh, the Ministry of Culture had offered us. So because to improve quality of life through a conservation effort. So in a sense, the work we've been doing since the past almost 15 years now, because we signed the MOU in 2007, includes the uh, 100 acre Humayun's tomb complex. It includes, uh, you know, the 10 hectares or uh, equivalent uh, Hazrat Nizamuddin Basti, which has a population of about 25,000, making it about 150,000 people uh, per square kilometer, which is one of the most densely inhabited 
but also one of the densest ensemble of medieval Islamic buildings. And it also includes what we've now created as a, a city park. We've uh, had 300,000 visitors last year in the first full year of operation. Um, so all of this was part of a single urban conservation project aimed at improving quality of life through multiple interventions. To do a project like this, we needed ASI, MCD, and the Central Public Works Department as partners and uh, dozens of uh, potential funding agencies that have allowed us to do major, major work. Uh, His Highness the Aga Khan still sort of bankrolls this project, 70 to 80% of funds are still from him. But all of these things really add up and enable us to do, have enabled us to do a lot more. Now, critically, since we're talking about world heritage cities, very significantly in 2016, not 17, as the slide says, we were able to increase the uh, area of the world heritage site from you know almost four times or more because it was 26 acres and now it is 53 acres. So that is that has been as a result of the conservation management landscape of these open spaces. So these are the 12 additional buildings that have been added to it. And you know we've done about 60 monuments. We've conserved about 60 monuments, created about 14 million man days of work for master craftsmen and uh, you know created real assets but this is what i really want to talk about uh, you know when we started we did a baseline survey in hazrat nizamuddin basti and we realized one percent of women had any economic opportunity we realized there was no vocational training for the youth we realized unemployment was incredible we realized 80 percent of children were malnourished we realized that less than one percent of the community had been to an open park in the last one year um, education, there was a primary school, but there were 40 students in a four-story building, which is dilapidated education. There was waste, waste was a huge, waste was the number one issue that, uh, as Amita mentioned in Jaisalmer, one of the worst things that the community wanted to be addressed. So over the last decade, we have not only restored some major monuments, uh, you know, 10 national monuments within the settlement, but 99.5% of the community has either found a job as a result of the vocational training, started using parks, the health, health we built a polyclinic for the local community, which is 25,000 people, but over the last seven years, 650,000 individual patients have accessed the polyclinic. We redid the school, which now has 600 kids rather than 40 when we started. We, 12 kids from this community have gone to American universities as a result of uh, you know, English and other trainings that we put them through. Uh, we relayed the sewer lines. We connected 200, uh, we collect, uh, 200 houses to, uh, we built houses, toilets in 200 houses, built a sewer line. Um, we collect waste. When we started collecting waste seven years ago, we were paying for it. Now we're paying 20% with the community paying 80%. And most importantly, uh, we've been handed over some of the unprotected monuments, such as the main mosque, to really conserve all of this. So. So this, uh, the idea of doing this was really to create a model uh, wherein with partnership with government and uh, community, one could start to address these problems. Now, again, the Basti is, there is no, as Amita said, there is, in Jaisalmer, there is no control because uh, you can build a 10 storied building here uh, if you know, you've got the right political patronage. So what we've been able to do is focus our attention on individual areas or small clusters, for example, the parks on the on the western side, the Dargah complex, the Joseph Trumpa. So we, we focus within the larger area on smaller area to do large scale uh, urban conservation. I know I'm off my time, so just last two slides. Uh, so this is what the Basti really looks like or used to look like a lot is better. This Bauli had 80 people living over it. We built alternate houses for them. And finally, since Poonam, uh, you know, who's a slave driver, asked me to talk about uh, the Hyderabad site. We're doing a similar project in uh, in Hyderabad with, with the government of Telangana, which this incredible site has 100 plus monuments. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what it looks like. Uh, it's it's mind boggling necropolis. Uh, um, and um, so not only are these 100 buildings being fixed, but we're also creating about uh, 40 acres of urban forest within it. We're landscaping everything. And, and the biggest challenge here is court cases. You know, it's, it's we, we've got the lawyer as our most expensive member of the team uh, because their land, even of this inter interesting site, is, is under question. Uh, but again, 
a very similar approach uh, to Sundar Nursery and Humayun's tomb uh, of craftsmanship. It removed several hundred thousand, you know, truckloads of cement from these monuments and uh, uh, giving them a, in a new lease of life. And finally, I'll leave you with these words from Daga Khan explaining uh, why we do what we do uh, in the built heritage. So like all other Aga Khan development network agencies, our principal objective is to have a positive impact uh, well beyond conservation. And that's what these projects tend to do. So thank you very much, uh, Poonam. I hope that uh, met your, uh, you know, whatever your expectations. Thank yes, you. it did. Thank you so much, Rakesh. Hi, are you there? Let me introduce Kai, who's joining us from Nepal. Also today, he is not, he is in the, yes, he'll tell you where he is joining us from. President of ICOMOS Nepal completed his master's in architecture from a Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, in 1992, and is presently a doctoral researcher in Department of Archaeology, Durham University. The research is on post-disaster rehabilitation of urban heritage and relationship between communities. Kai has been working as a planner and architect in the Himalayan region and has facilitated the establishment of management systems of world heritage in Nepal, Uzbekistan, and Myanmar. Kai is responsible for coordinating cultural sector response after the 2015 Gorkha earthquake in Nepal and the 2016 chalk earthquake in Myanmar. Thank you so much, Kai. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, I do hope uh, you can hear me. I'm uh, in Lumbini at the moment, and uh, I try to get the best internet connection possible around here. But uh, please do let me know if uh, if you cannot hear me or if it uh, isn't uh, clear. Um, so I will not be talking about any specific example, other than, of course, that I worked in Kathmandu in Nepal. Uh, my presentation is slightly more theoretical, but it sort of touches upon the challenges that I've faced. Um, and uh, I'd like to sort of uh, give these, this short presentation the title of Living Urban Heritage. Um, and you might see that uh, the acronym is uh, L-U-H and not H-U-L. Um, so focusing on the living, and I think, uh, you know, the title that's given to this series, I think uh, it, it, we really need to focus on the living part of it. And uh, up to now, uh, you know, over the last decade, we always talk about uh, the non-living aspects of heritage. And... Uh, so starting with this example, in uh, 2013, we organized a, a, a symposium, a workshop in Kathmandu in preparation for the next big earthquake. Uh, we, of course, had no idea that it was actually going to happen. Um, we knew that uh, you know, the last big one was the 1934 Bihar-Nepal earthquake. And we also knew that every 80 to 100 years, we have this big earthquake. So uh, to make it more realistic, we said, look, it's going to be 80 years. We start uh, working on the countdown for the next earthquake. We are always between two earthquakes, uh, as Sir Bernard Fieldman's mentioned. Um, so we were preparing for this earthquake. And uh, the symposium focused on four themes, and this was discussing authenticity. And uh, it's interesting because the discussion uh, which led to the NARA document actually began with a conflict in Kathmandu. Uh, then we have the whole question of management plans, which are required for World Heritage Sites, and you know what is the effective approach to managing heritage, and you know are these management plans really effective or not? 
Uh, then, of course, the whole main topic of uh, the symposium of uh, the next great earthquake, which was going to be 80 years in 2014. It was, of course, interesting to, to our shock, actually, the earthquake did take place in 2015, uh, though we were preparing, you know, previously. And of course, uh, a lot of this preparation was done in close collaboration with uh, Rohit and his uh, uh, his position at the Ritzmaikan University. So uh, I learned a lot from him uh, and we were preparing for this, but once the earthquake really strikes, uh, things are uh, rather different in, in reality. And the question is, you know, how, how do we actually deal with this? And then the fourth point was communities, which uh, actually gives light to heritage in the sense that it's not just, uh, you know, the, the, the material heritage, but we're really looking at the communities and the living heritage. Uh, the document actually can be uh, downloaded. Uh, it's sort of interesting uh, sort of compilation of uh, papers and sort of our discussion. I just wanted to come back to these four points. Uh, val authenticity, which we are looking at value. Management in the sense uh, of uh, the urban context, we're talking about governance. Uh, earthquakes, more generally threats. Uh, and then communities, we're talking about the people. So it's not just communities, we're talking about individual people. And so uh, what do we need to deal with and understand and address these issues? So in connection with value, uh, you know, it's, it's a question of what do we want to keep, what to conserve, to protect. Uh, very often we get lost in the discussion of value uh, but for what? Uh, it really has to be linked to identifying that which we want to keep, uh, protect, conserve. Then in connection with governance, uh, you know, who is responsible, how to protect, we have uh, you know, the, the whole aspect of uh, what tools we have to be able to actually carry out uh, uh, that which is required to protect the heritage. And threats, of course, what are the issues, hazards, concerns? It's, uh, you know, it's a broader than the discussion on uh, factors affecting the property. Uh, and then the people to whom, you know, for whom are we doing this? Community stakeholders, and we get lost with a lot of these words and we aren't quite sure, uh, you know, community, we always talk about community, but uh, who are they actually? And just, uh, you know, generally talking about what tools uh, do we have? So very often we have uh, regulatory uh, tools, uh, you know, prohibiting thing. We are not allowed to do this and that. Uh, then we have uh, tools that are guiding, guided, you know, uh, development. Uh, we have uh, basically, you know, guiding communities in a certain direction. But then uh, we also have promotional, motivational tools here, uh, again, uh, really the question is, are we using the right tools? Do we have the right tools in place? The question of scale. Uh, we talk about landscapes, sites, uh, which basically we're talking about the city. We're talking about monument structures. We're talking about cultural objects and intangible heritage, which is linked to the living. Now, if you look at the tools, we have the conservation tools for monument structures. Very often, we're also dealing with cultural objects, linking it to museums. Uh, but do we really understand how to deal with these larger scale landscapes? And especially when we are looking at it from a, from a sense of conservation, uh, we really don't have the tools to deal with that scale. And then we're again now talking about intangible heritage, which is sort of the living heritage. You know, do we know how to deal with this? I mean, are we supposed to deal with it or do we just let people live their lives? Uh, you know, we have this, uh, the intangible uh, convention uh, where, uh, you know, they, they have a certain approach, but sort of the living heritage, especially in the urban context requires a very different approach. Um, so again, coming to, uh, you know, this whole conflict between these, differentiate between development conservation. I think this has been mentioned over and over again. It should be the same thing. We still haven't been able to deal with it. You know, integrating conservation into planning, I think it's still a you know, huge divide. So 
in a, in, a, in a certain sense, we have to understand that cultural heritage is not a luxury, but an intrinsic component of living cities. And this has not really happened. Very often we you know, have different sectors working on different aspects and we conserve certain parts and we don't conserve certain parts and that differentiation uh, isn't really working. Now, in connection with this, I'd like to highlight three main points and uh, these are a bit awkward, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll still like to, to pose these points uh, for discussion. One is that, uh, for example, uh, we are proud that cultural heritage is mentioned in the SDGs, uh, but it's just mentioned. It's, you know, I believe it's a critical part for the success of the SDGs that cultural heritage, uh, culture in a certain sense and heritage in, a, in different aspects is critical for the success of the SDGs. And it's not something that you mentioned under you know, urban context in 11.4, and then it's linked to uh, tourism development. No, you know, whether it's education, whether it's health, you know, without considering cultural heritage, it is not going to work, especially in the rural context, you know, where we're looking at communities with still linked to strong cultural, uh, their own cultural heritage. The second point is of course, the elephant in the room, uh, corruption and politics. And very often one doesn't want to talk about it, one shouldn't talk about it. I did still want to mention it. But the question isn't how to get, you know, I don't think we can really deal with, uh, with these and uh, eradicate it. But the question is, how do we succeed despite this elephant in the room? And uh, we really need to try to understand that, you know, we set up management systems the most critical aspect we're not allowed to talk about. Now, yes, we will have to deal with it and uh, we will have to find some ways of uh, ensuring success, you know, despite uh, these hurdles. Then the third point, uh, which is something that I've been really working on uh, in, in detail, I'm doing a PhD on this, is uh, for the living context, we must have community, which is not a statistical amorphous entity. So it's you know, we just talk about community as, oh yes, we have to deal with community. The community wants this, the community should be helped. But community means they're individual people. And, you know, it's not homogeneous. They are different people, they're different interests. And this, the complexity of actually dealing with commu community is far beyond just mentioning that community should also be part of the, you know, the equation and really getting down to trying to understand how does this work and how do we actually deal with this uh, whole issue of community really needs to be studied uh, much more in detail. So this is my short presentation, hopefully bringing up a few points, some uh, of course difficult to discuss, but I think uh, you know, one should uh, mention this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shikha Jain. Her extensive portfolio covers conservation, world heritage and museum projects across India and overseas, largely realized through her organization, Drona. Many of you know this uh, name. She steered all UNESCO inscriptions for Rajasthan. She is vice president, uh, Ecofort, Ecomos, advisory committee member, uh, for UNESCO C2C, Dehradun, and a member of the Advisory Committee on World Heritage Matters, ASI. Shikha, it's all yours. Thank you for being part of this session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank or good morning, good evening, good morning, wherever uh, everyone is across the world. Um, uh, before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank EPG uh, for inviting me uh, for this session and to Vinayak and Poonam for this, you know, very well curated uh, theme, uh, which is particularly close to my heart. Uh, my presentation actually touches upon the key points that have been uh, mentioned in the background for this forum. Uh, the historic urban landscape recommendation, the world heritage status for our various cities and its impact on these cities. And uh, finally, you know, looking at how should cities achieve conservation, socioeconomic goals and involve stakeholders. 
And I'm presenting this within the larger framework of how Indian cities are moving towards world heritage or have achieved this status or partially have implemented the historic urban landscape recommendations with some specific focus on Jaipur where I have been working for several years. If we look at the current scenario, you know, historic cities is, is one of the largest heritage category on the World Heritage List. So we have about 311 World Heritage cities inscribed from a total of 1154 properties, and of course, two of them in India. And looking back, I'm starting from 2011, which seems to be a very uh, critical year for, uh, for urban heritage across the world, as, a, as well as I would say for India also. Um, and this was at the UNESCO General Assembly that the external auditors report mentioned in Asia, the preservation of urban ensembles is not covered by any legislation in some states, parties, as for example, India, although it has remarkable urban heritage. So the fact that historic Indian cities, you know, have a, um, a lot of them have outstanding value or have great value, cultural value, was recognized across the world and even in such UNESCO documents long before you know we started inscribing these cities but clearly uh, legislation was one of the points you know that was recorded here and another point that was in general mentioned in this external auditor report was that we are uh, UNESCO is giving too much emphasis and in fact all the state parties to the world heritage uh, inscription there are other culture conventions and probably we, we need to look at that and this is something I would also say is relevant for historic Indian cities. And we tried to, uh, you know, apply this in Jaipur, as I will show you later. Uh, 2011 was also the year when this important historic urban landscape recommendation was adopted. And you can see that this was a recommendation which really looked at the city holistically. You know, one is looking at not just the built heritage, but also the intangible uh, the cultural practices, the economic processes, the social values, and not just above the surface, but also, you know, under geomorphology, hydrology, and looking at questions like what has already been, um, you know, indicated for this particular forum on how to achieve socioeconomic uh, upliftment or involve the stakeholders. So this uh, really was a very important uh, benchmark recommendation for historic uh, cities and this year, of course, it completes uh, 10 years. But looking at what was happening in India, the journey of world heritage cities, again, 2011 was when Ahmedabad uh, was the first. Uh, it was not really the first, but it, it uh, was in, uh, put on the tentative list for India. The one, the city that was placed before this was Chandigarh, which is currently removed from the tentative list, as I have noted here in 2016, because it was the capital complex that got inscribed instead of the city there. But if you see Ahmedabad, you know, in 2011, then Delhi and Ardoko Ensemble of Mumbai in 2012, 2014, Ekam Shetra was added, 2015, Jaipur City was added. And then you see 27, 2018, 2019, continuously three years we had focus on, you know, the world heritage cities or the urban ensemble getting inscribed. And this really, as uh, you know, had a you know significant impact on other cities, which started considering you know even cities like Agra, which I think Jigna would maybe would touch upon, that wanted to be World Heritage or Gwalior or Pondicherry. Uh, so there are so many now in the queue. So definitely, this uh, whole process has had an impact. And you know, now even now we continue historic ensemble of Archa and uh, then uh, Varanasi that came in later. At the national level, you know, there were also a lot of urban conservation initiatives that uh, you can see came up uh, starting from 2014, 2015, 2013, 14, when NURM incorporated Heritage for City Development Plan, then of course the Hilde scheme, which was quite a benchmark for 12 heritage cities. So we are looking at urban uh, heritage incorporated into planning and projects actually coming out of that planning, which was a very different scenario from what we used to practice before. And of course, we do have the smart city scheme now in whatever form, which is funding a lot of urban conservation projects. Uh, 
Um, and currently, this is from a Niti Aayog report that we are just submitting on the historic city status in India. We do have two cities uh, world heritage, on World Heritage List, three on the tentative list, one uh, historic on some inscribed and one on the tentative list. Then of course, 12 under Hede, and there are more than 60 cities that have historic cores funded through smart cities, uh, um, you know, the historic project. So in fact, we realized the, that Hirde only funded about 500 crores across these 12 cities, but under smart cities, more than a thousand crores has gone into urban conservation projects. So this is to give you an overview, but uh, you know, uh, what we need to realize that the three cities that re uh, achieved inscription, including the Mumbai uh, urban ensemble, or even others that are there, which have been presented, you know, by you know, Amita or on Varanasi, it all had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, background on previous work. It was not just put on the tentative list. You know, they had years of uh, work behind. Uh, I'm just going to show it in case of Jaipur, but we all know that other cities worked in a similar manner um, before this inscription was realized. And for Jaipur, you can see from 2006, seven, when the heritage management plan was prepared, which was the first heritage management plan for any city in India. Till 2021, today, you know, with post inscription, the works are, you know, continuing in some form or the other, whether it's conservation projects or UNESCO recognition or at planning level. So, uh, it's like I said, the, these are actually historic urban landscape tools. So I'm just showing how some of these tools were already applied um, in some form or the other. So the first tool of knowledge and planning, you know, the built heritage management plan in 2006, seven was drafted and this was consciously uh, followed to implement various works, uh, including the inscription for the city. The regulatory tools, which are so important, the first facade control guidelines were prepared in 2009 by Jaipur Virasat Foundation and Drona. And uh, these, I mean, if I would like to say how the city's uh, inscription impact, uh, you would be surprised to know that these, though these guidelines were prepared in 2009, finally it was in 2018 when the city was you know, about to get inscribed that uh, the government finally adopted it. They realized it was so important. So the official notification came uh, at that time. And currently the heritage cell uh, within the Jaipur Nagar Nigam heritage is actually working on further facade guidelines for more bazaars and, and the inner areas of Jaipur. Uh, the civic engagement tools, again, public participation and heritage has been there for years in Jaipur and it continues in some form or the other. Uh, so this is uh, a picture of the participatory heritage walk and financial tools this is the facade conservation works for three bazaars of jaipur that was uh, carried out in 2013 14 and this is the first urban conservation facade project that was funded by the ministry of urban development in fact the question that was raised was that why should government spend money on uh, you know facades of private uh, uh, houses and it was uh, because the Jaipur Municipal Corporation has a mandate to maintain the color and the, the urban character of the cities. So that was, you know, justified through that. And finally, the ministry agreed. And this example was again used when we were working on the Hirde cities. We were 12 different consultants on 12 cities and everyone one wanted to propose heritage walks and facade conservation. And the issue came up again that government, uh, you know, ministry said that why should we fund? And then this example of Jaipur was used that it's already done once. And, and this is what would retain the urban character for which the municipalities should be responsible. Uh, so in that sense, it was, uh, you know, it, it is one of the first uh, case of financial tools uh, from the Ministry of Urban Development that supported this. And this particular landscape approach, there was uh, there, a publication in 2019 where uh, case studies, 30 plus case studies from across the world uh, were looked at to see how this urban landscape approach is implemented. And from India, there were two case studies, Amravati Heritage Town and Jaipur that, were, uh, that are uh, showcased in this particular publication. The city got inscribed in 2019 under three criteria. Uh, you know, looking at its uh, magnificence, um, you know, of the town planning and iconic monuments, it's, it's uh, you know, a 
city planning and urban form reflecting ancient and modern influences to produce a commercial city. It was a trade city unparalleled in scale and magnificence uh, in, in that particular period. But what was more important was that it also got recognized for its criteria six, which is the intangible heritage and uh, another UNESCO uh, designation that we achieved for it was the creative city of crafts and folk art. And this was completely with the intention of uh, linking socioeconomics and livelihood of the craftspeople. Um, Jaipur is known as you know, the city which was planned on the Chhattis Karkhana. So, so it's not just the built heritage which is being celebrated, but also the creative crafts and upgrading the craftspeople's uh, areas and this is now what is uh, what uh, one is trying to do through a, in, through cooperation of several organizations in the city, linking the two UNESCO designations, both World Heritage with its criteria six on intangible and creative city to achieve socioeconomic improvement and sustainability. So we have heritage walks, including the built heritage, but also ensure that the Please wrap up. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so this is the last one now, just two, three slides. Uh, this is the Chhattisgana workshop and our recent attempt of several organizations in the city to uh, come up with this jaipurworldheritage.com website, which uh, uh, has all the um, information on creative cities as well as, as well as world heritage and is supposed to work as a citizen's voice on any component uh, of heritage or within the Jaipur wall city area. So I think this is my yeah last slide and uh, saying that can we adapt the historic urban landscape recommendations tool for Indian cities for these purpose and uh, of course some of these tools have already been applied not only in Jaipur but in other areas in other cities also. And this is something probably would be a good uh, framework to follow for future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shikha. Let me introduce our next speaker, Dennis Rodwell. Dennis. I'm coming, hello. Hi. So Dennis Rodwell is a consultant architect planner and independent researcher based in Scotland, United Kingdom. He works internationally in the field of cultural heritage and sustainable urban development focused on the promotion and achievement of best practice in the management of the broadly defined historic environment. Previously a principal in private architecture practice, he has also served in local government posts as architect, conservation officer, urban designer, principal planner, and project manager. He writes and publishes widely on the theme of conservation and sustainability in historic cities. Welcome, Dennis, over to you. I'm trying to screen share. Am I succeeding? Yes, uh, but you have got the notes. Uh, I think the Q&A or the chat is on right now. You need to select your uh, presentation when you open. So please exit, stop sharing. You can just uh, go hover onto your PDF. Maybe you would have. First, please open your PDF for the, yeah. Yes, you're on. Have I worked? Okay, well, uh, first no. of all, oh, yeah. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, see me? Yes? Yes, all good. Right. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all very much for inviting, um, let's say, a stranger outside the region to speak. Uh, when I accepted the invitation to join this forum, I wasn't expecting to be talking about Liverpool. But here we are. Um, and I'm hoping that there are some useful indicators from the deletion of Liverpool. I've called it a failure of process. Um, this is not a new title for me. In 2015, I published a joint article with my friend uh, Benedict Gaillard, um, which we called a failure of 
process with a question mark against it, which dealt with um, two cases, cultural heritage, which have now both been delisted. Uh, this article can be accessed and downloaded from my academia site. Um, the delisting of Liverpool serves to focus attention on the challenges of managing urban heritage sites that are subject to development pressures, especially those that are inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Key responsibilities arise, local, national, international, the roles of ICOMOS and UNESCO. The focus of this presentation will be on the ICOMOS UNESCO processes, um, and the question of whether these help or hinder management at the national and local level. Um, I'm imagining that there are lessons for other World Heritage cities. The dream of the 1972 convention is, as the preamble says, an effective system of collective protection of the cultural natural heritage of outstanding universal value organized on a permanent basis and in accordance with modern scientific methods. The process engages with outstanding universal value and according to the criteria one to six. There's a critical path with outstanding universal value. Essentially, if something is not in the statement of open OUV at the time of inscription, for whatever reason, it is effectively not part of the OUV. This is a core lesson from Liverpool. Liverpool was known, uh, one or two other cities were as well, um, for a, a different times, as the second city of empire. And the, the classic images of the peerhead group um, this was taken by me in 2007. The timeline of uh, Liverpool is one of ascendancy and descendancy. Um, ascendant from the late 18th to the early 20th centuries and descendant from the First World War onwards. Liverpool's ambition at the uh, turn as we entered the present millennium was an ambition to recover the status of a world city from what was effectively a standing start. There was a huge risk involved, a highly volatile situation, a primordial potential for heritage versus development conflict, and an essential need, extreme care, and the critical seas of effective protection, certainty, clarity, and consistency. The timeline um, of the World Heritage Site, in tandem with historic urban landscape, starts from 1999, when Liverpool was placed on the UK tentative list, 2003, the nomination and management plan, 2004, inscription, 2005, the UNESCO Vienna Memorandum, managing the historic urban landscape, 2006, the first UNESCO ICOMOS mission, 2011, the HUL recommendation, 2011, almost to the same day, the second UNESCO ICOMOS mission, um, and leading to the uh, delisting in just a few weeks ago. The Liverpool World Heritage Site has been treated as a test case for the UNESCO Historic Urban La Landscape Initiative. Inscription on the list of World Heritage in Danger followed uh, by listing confirms that this test case has failed. According to this timeline, given that the inscription was before UNESCO basically uh, published the notion of historic urban landscape, should Liverpool ever have been treated as a test case for HUL? Just a brief, um, what I really want you to do is to focus on the right-hand picture um, because the right-hand picture is in the nomination document 2003 and integrates three-dimensionally the contours of the waterfront uh, in which the, um, the three, the pierhead group, the three buildings in the pierhead group are dominant um, 
just north of the Albert Docks, Albert Dock. A core theme in the State Party's nomination document, the surviving urban landscape testifies to the historical role of Liverpool as a great port city and defines its tangible authenticity. The focal point, the Peerhead Group, forms a dramatic manifestation of Liverpool's significance, whose vast scale allows them to dominate the waterfront when approached by sheep, by, by ship. Emphasis on the historic urban landscape, the term features 47 times in the nomination, which is visible on the accessible on the UNESCO website. The term historic urban landscape also features before the UNESCO usage. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but in the um, 2004 ICOMOS evaluation assessment, which is uh, part of the website, the um, ICOMOS stated that the justification by the state party um, for inscription was set against the three criteria two, three, and four, and which I've highlighted in red. The urban landscape of the site forms a unique testimony. That's under criterion, criteria three. Criteria four, the nominated site is a complete and integral urban landscape. That's all I need to focus on here because the problem is, um, and this is the core problem with the nomination or rather with the um, deletion of Liverpool, is that all mention of urban landscape, let alone historic urban landscape, was deleted, erased from the ICOMOS recommendation with respect to inscription. Going back to the linear sequence, if something is not in the statement of OUV, it is not something, it is not part of the OUV. So Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City was inscribed on the basis with this wording recommended by um, ICOMOS, having already stated what the state party had said. Um, uh, this is, these are the three criteria, uh, texts of the three criteria against which Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City was inscribed. An obvious question is why was urban landscape erased between the nomination and the inscription? This was at the time an error. It has proved to be a catastrophic error. Now I have been involved with the Liverpool case um, since the turn of the millennium. Um, and uh, I was working as conservation officer for the city of Derby. Um, and I was working on the nomination which was successful in 2002 of Derwent Valley Mills. I worked, uh, if you like, in a team with other local authorities that were involved in the nominations of Saltaire, New Lanark, Liverpool. So I was very closely involved in the processes of preparing the nomination, which was slightly later, of Liverpool and in what has happened ever since. A huge frustration occurred to the two people one for UNESCO, one for ICOMOS, who led the 2006 UNESCO ICOMOS mission, reactive monitoring mission. They were frustrated to the point of being annoyed at the switch and the erasion of urban landscape from the inscribed texts. This prevented them from commenting on any issue affecting the urban landscape. By 2006, some of these tall buildings on the left, this is a photograph I took in 2011, had already been started or were being built. They could not comment on these because the terms of reference for that mission focused on the Museum of Liverpool, which is on the right, and the Man Island buildings, which are just behind it, which are black, um, and that was effectively the limit of the terms of reference of that mission. 
So the conclusion of being unable to talk about the urban landscape um, of that 2006 mission was that the outstanding use of universal value was not threatened. The state of conservation of the site in its widest urban context, its integrity and authenticity were described as good. Redevelopment initiatives in progress or proposed aim at carefully re-establishing the city's coherence through the enhancement of its numerous remaining historical features. And then immediately that the 2011 UNESCO Historic Urban Landscape recommendation was approved and I was involved from sub-basement level in the progress of that recommendation. Immediately a further reactive monitoring mission took place and invoked urban landscape as the reason which led the following year to Liverpool being placed on the list in danger. This was at that time as the result of the project for Liverpool waters. This is a photo, this is a photograph uh, taken in 2009 um, showing the urban landscape in the region of the three, uh, the Peerhead group and the buildings which had already been built. Uh, if you can recollect the very first aerial photograph I showed, uh, these are all new since inscription. The Liverpool Waters project was a speculative one. This is a visualization. This is not a photograph. This is a visualization of what um, Liverpool Waters was thought to look like in 2014, um, immediately adjacent to the historic city centre and the waterfront. We then come to what has proved to be the clinch for delisting, which is the project for the uh, Bramley Moor Dock Everton Stadium project. This visualisation, it hasn't been built. This visualization is very helpful in showing its relationship to the historic core, to the waterfront. Um, the uh, Peerhead group are uh, in the coming semi-distance. Semi um, it is the Bramley Moor Dock is at the very northernmost boundary of the World Heritage Site. The boundary is just to the near side of uh, the building visualization. Failure of process. The switch between uh, the justification text elaborated by the state parties 2003 nomination document and the 2004 ICOMOS advisory body recommendation signaled to the state party and Liverpool City Council in the volatile situation which had already existed in Liverpool that the urban landscape was not a factor that determined the inscribed World Heritage Sites outstanding universal value and could not be monitored as such. It was thus not a, fact, a factor that could be considered at the time of the 2006 reactive mon monitoring mission and was only invoked retrospectively upon the adoption of the Hull recommendation in 2011. At no point has ICOMOS acknowledged responsibility for the 2004 error, for any of the consequences arising therefrom or advanced reconciliation. On February 5th, 2020, World Heritage UK wrote to the director of the UNESCO World Heritage Centre proposing a way forward for, uh, of a boundary change to the World Heritage Site to exclude Bramley Moor Dock, which, as I showed, is at the very northernmost boundary of the World Heritage Site. This conciliatory offer was not taken up. On the 1st of August 2021, World Heritage Watch, namely Stefan Domka, published the following post-deletion reflection. For Liverpool, the deletion from the World Heritage List had also been recommended. First, it looked like this would be prevented too. Only when Norway demanded a secret vote, the majorities changed. One may assume that political pressure on former colonies 
in the World Heritage Committee no longer works at this moment and that some of them didn't hesitate to teach a lesson to the former motherland, Europe, the West. So my question, which is prompted by this very recent publication, is was the delisting of Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City based on ethical and scientific principles, or as many recent World Heritage Committee decisions on political considerations? Now, there are serious lessons to be learned from the uh, whole process involving Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City. I'm not quite clear how these can be picked up in India, but I do know that the three C's, the critical three C's of consistency, clarity, um, and the other one are vital. And that if you do not have the pillars in place to support a heritage directed uh, process of care and sustainability, then you are going to lose out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Very insightful. Our next speaker is Jigna Desai. She is an associate professor and program chair for the Masters in Conservation and Regeneration, the Faculty of Architecture at SEP University in Ahmedabad. She's also the executive director of the Center for Heritage Conservation at SEPT's Research and Development Foundation. She has worked extensively on architecture projects, conservation research and advisory issues in different parts of India. She's carried out advocacy for community-based conservation in partnership with national and international institutions and government organizations. She's written several papers on conservation and the regeneration of historic cities. She's an expert member of the International Scientific Committee for Historic Towns and Villages of the International Council for Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS. Chigna, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Nayok, Unam, Kirtibhai, and uh, the INHAF team. I don't have a presentation, but uh, I just realized I turned a true academician when I wrote a thousand word paper that I'm going to read out. It should take less than eight minutes. Uh, if I had to give a title to this talk, it would be World Heritage in India, whose voice is it anyway? To conserve world heritage with the intention of enabling an understanding of diverse cultures, plural, plural histories and significant human achievements is one of the good ideas humankind has come up with. And to think that this was an idea that followed the world wars makes us collectively reflect upon the values that are sought to be upheld by conserving the world heritage. If done right, it is a step towards peace building. So this short talk is not a critique for the idea or the process of identifying world heritage with the purpose of conserving it. I think Dennis has already made a very interesting case of that. I would put out some reflections based on my agency as a researcher, educational and practitioner of heritage conservation in some historic cities of India. The first point I want to make is that we need to be better prepared before we claim the glory of World Heritage. World Heritage City is a city or a part of it. The boundaries that we draw on the dossier are notional. On ground, there is a dynamic relationship between the monument, non-monumental, social economies and natural systems. There are urban government systems or lack of them. Cultural heritage itself then is, a const is constantly moving and there's time to change in response to its relationships. When we document heritage, we rarely bother to map these relationships. Instead, we take these boundaries that we draw, on, draw in our drawings quite literally on ground. The long-standing discussion of ASI boundaries is one example and the Agra's projects that Ms. Big spoke about are an example of that. The constant push for making the historic city of Ahmedabad a special economic zone is another. These approaches leave the living city vulnerable to hegemonic positions. Second point I want to make is that a more modern perspective on heritage is that it provides possibilities to understand histories with all its biases and affords us as individuals, individuals a conscious and confident choice of continuity or change. Let's take the example of IIM Ahmedabad. While not a World Heritage Site, the most pointed response to the alleged demolition came from the architects. 
It could be because we have learned how to express ourselves better as a community. But more likely, this was because many of us, for many of us, IM is a point of reference, a datum. Many architects of the 20th century and thereon place their sense of professional history in architecture of modern masters and see themselves as part of this continuum, not necessarily by replicating them, but by studying these works for their meanings and then making a conscious and confident choice for being a part or not of an ideological continuum. In that spirit, everyone who gets affected by erasures of a site is someone who needs to have a voice. Third point that I'm making, we will have to learn how to deal with people and conflicts. Most of our processes valorize the glory and the beauty of heritage while, den while denying the complexities of its past. Well, glory sells. When we as experts write dossiers that focus only on the glorious past, we by default exclude the inhabitants. All of us, regardless of where we live, have an ontological relationship with our built environment. Violence, injustice, marginalization is all a part of that relationship. Much of the failure of conservation efforts in historic cities is attributed to lack of awareness amongst people to recognize their own heritage. This argument is made on the basis of an assumption that academic and administrative understanding of what constitutes heritage is what inhabitants also ought to recognize as their own. There are definitely groups of people who recognize these official narratives as their own heritage. And as, as, as an abstract notion, almost everyone does. However, there are groups of people and individuals, for example, in Ahmedabad, who drive their sense of history and self from the nationalist movements of Gandhi and Abdul Ghaffar Khan, from labor movements of earlier 20th century, from the feminist movements in the history, from the movements of social reforms, from the devout spiritual relationships that they have, from their losses during many caste-based and communal riots that the city has undergone, and much more. Many abandoned structure in the historic city of Ahmedabad still lay in as, as testimonies to these difficult and non-glorious histories. To be true to the promise of a world heritage, for it to be an effort for peace building, we need to start with the people and their histories who inhabit these places. Fourth point, let's understand that buildings erode, sometimes irreversible. The argument to be made for cities and living sites is not to extend the life of material heritage and memory of the non-material indefinitely, but to engage with time and place sensitive efforts to extend its life as much as it is possible through the current available means. And when it is not possible, recognize the effect of that erasure in all forms and record it. Give the process of erasure a memory of its own so that it may still be available for the future generation of individuals as a historic reference. If I had a bit of a bit more time, I would have loved to draw a parallel with an originally Marathi movie called Ventilator. It sums up the sentiments of letting go beautifully. The fifth point that I want to say is that we need to understand the politics and economics around heritage better. I think it's already been said in the previous talks. And when I say economics, I mean it as inclusive of built environment as a resource. There have been enough studies to show the relationships between man-made disasters like fires and riots and shifts in real estate prices or demographics of a city. There is also enough evidence where heritage conservation has led to gentrification, the bad kind. These are not always side effects of heritage conservation. There can be strategies for some political or economic gain. Coming to the question of world heritage cities, where are we heading? In my very personal opinion, we are successfully using the tag for political and economic gains, and we've learned how to exploit it. As a community of built environment practitioners, we also mean well but we don't have our hand on the pulse. We tend to see our work as apolitical, not concerned with economics of the place. We also believe that we are not activists, thus we don't deal with people. And yes, we must continue to strive to rise above all of that in the pursuit of history. However, the only way for us to rise above it 
is to first understand and negotiate with the very deeply social nature of heritage. In absence of that, we are either tools to implement a larger strategy or a redundant opposition. We are way off from the purpose of world heritage, and most of us would cease to be a relevant voice. Thank you. Yes, Jigna. Thank you so much for that. We come back to those discussions. Rohi Jigyasu, next speaker. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I... No, 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 no. I'm just introducing you. Great. I just wanted to see you first. Here, uh, please keep your video on. Yes, he's a conservation architect and risk management professional from India, currently working at ICROM as project manager on urban heritage, climate change, and disaster risk management. Rohit also served as UNESCO chairholder professor at the Institute of Disaster Mitigation of Urban Cultural Heritage at Rizbuken University, Kyoto, Japan. He was elected president of Ecomos India from 2014 and 2018 and president of Ecomos International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness, I thought, from 2010 to 19. He served as elected member of executive committee of Ecomos since 2011 and was its president, vice president from 2017 to 2020. Before joining ICROM, Rohit has been working with several national and international organizations such as UNESCO, UNISDR, Getty Conservation Institute, and World Bank for consultancy, research, and training on disaster risk management of cultural heritage. Rohit, over to you. Um. Thank you very much, Poonam, for your generous uh, introduction. And thank you for waking me up early in the morning. It's good to wake up early in the morning. So you are improving my habits. So that's good. <laughs> Let me share my presentation. Um, initially, I thought uh, I will not uh, present, but uh, I got nervous when I saw everyone presenting. So I created a presentation very quickly. Uh, you know, just joking. So uh, I'm also going to... Uh, be a little bit provocative in my uh, in my presentation because I think uh, this is an uh, this is an opportunity for us to question things and really uh, you know sometimes uh, take the bull by its horn you know as they say so uh, and I'm I'm saying uh, we make heri heritage cities resilient and does world heritage tag really help and uh, so uh, of course Jaipur is our world heritage city we are very proud of it. Uh, Shika has done extensive work on it and she presented it very well. Um, and so is Ahmedabad. Uh, the question is that when we call, uh, when we designate a city as a world heritage, we really emphasize on outstanding universal values and rightly so. But the, the challenge for cities is that OUV, is it enough or is it standing on its own? Or OU, is OUV actually uh, based on larger sets of values. And if those values are not there, what's OUV going to do in a vacuum? And I just take you this example from Jaipur, where of course you have the palace, you have all the built fabric, but there is much more to that. And a lot of values which are owned by the people, and I'm, I'm now saying whose values, are not maybe lying in those uh, palaces, but maybe lie in things which are more humble. And if they are disappearing, and if they are not recognized because everybody is pursuing OUV, then where are we going to head? Because city, of course, as Jigna said, belongs to its people. And if people are taken out of that city, then whose heritage are we really talking about? So just a question, because in our planning paradigm, all these are sometimes treated as informal sector or, or a sector which is kind of creating illegal, you know, encroachments and so has to be removed. Uh, so we have many world heritage uh, uh, cities on there now. I mean, this is a little old plan, uh, old uh, map, but we have many more now. And, uh, but as you see, many of the cities are actually located uh, along the river or along the coast, 
which also means that we have other challenge to face when we talk about uh, cities and well say world heritage cities uh, is that they are actually much more vulnerable to uh, disasters that are caused by climate related changes and we have example I mean, this is from Ahmedabad uh, in India we have several examples of such urban flooding that's increasing and it's not only in India we know what happened in Germany and in Belgium very recently so we have another issue to address which is whether we have some um, are we going to address this issue with the world heritage tag is it going to help cities in certain way uh, or not so this is another question that i i have and the fact that we call world heritage cities because we designate them with a boundary you no know? core area then we sometimes designate a buffer area but is it that we can just take that city out uh, which is designated from the larger context in which that city is existing because World Heritage City is not a city in itself, it's a part of the city. So, you know, we may call it uh, uh, a city, but and sometimes it gives us a false impression that it's a city where, uh, uh, with its own boundaries, but it is so much interconnected to the larger urban context that we need to understand what's happening in the larger urban scenario to really address the issues of the World Heritage uh, as well. And what we see here is very clear that uh, the urbanization is really making cities much more densified and India is actually a front leader in that. We are not front leaders in many things, but at least in this we are for sure. And uh, this is where we are heading, where many of our cities are actually going to join together in a big urban agglomeration, you know, in the future. So when we look at, when we point at that World Heritage tag here, we have to also understand that in the next couple of uh, years or couple of decades, we are going to end up, these cities are going to be, these world heritage tags will be just little dots within the larger urban agglomeration where many cities are going to just come together. So, uh, of course, we struggle with uh, what happens with the urban fabric when the new uh, developments happen and, and definitely they pose a great risk to urban heritage. This is in Mumbai, in Bandra, actually, and you can see what, what, what is happening. But there is the other side of the coin, which I also want to talk about. We talk about mega cities mostly, but we forget about the small and the medium-sized cities. The phenomena in the small cities is very different than the phenomena in the, urban, in the, in the mega cities. While there's urban pressure in big cities, many, many Indian historic cities, which actually deserve World Heritage Tag, are very small cities. Like you take example from Junjunu in Shekhavati region. I mean, what's happening in those cities? If you go to those cities, they are being depopulated. You know, how many times we talk about depopulation uh, in cities? Because we are always so much focused about overpopulation in cities. We forget that we are looking at just a minor section of the cities. We are not looking at many more historic cities which are very small and their historic fabric or the urban heritage is actually abundant. People are not having jobs to stay there. They are moving out and these havelis are falling apart. So let's understand from the larger urban development context what's happening to our cities. And then I want to come to another issue and I take example from Bangalore. Uh, we, I mean, I, you must have read these news with the lakes being on fire. Now, what's the issue here? And when we start to look at them very carefully, we know that many of these lakes are not actually functioning as they were designed because the urban development process has totally destroyed. And if you look at city of Bangalore now, there are lakes are like isolated pockets without any connection to you know, each other. But that was not how they were original. There was a very definitive ecology of the place that has been totally destroyed. So even when we talk about the heritage or the urban heritage, how much are we really understanding it from the point of view of natural heritage? You know, this is my other uh, issue that I want to highlight. Is World Heritage Shack really recognizing, we talk about urban landscape, but how much are we protecting that landscape, which is the canvas for our urban heritage? And that's another thing we have to definitely look at. And the other, uh, I think I'm coming to the last two issues that I want to highlight is that we 
as World Heritage Tag or as a heritage city may be focused within the heritage conservation and management sector, but can we address it on its own without really linking it to the larger? There are so many examples which I don't have time to explain, but the challenge is that all our quote, there is no coordination between different sectors. You know, we, we keep on talking about all these issues that heritage is facing, but without these uh, interconnections, without culture being transversal, because there is a problem with this World Heritage Tag. We are actually creating a culture as a silo, you know, and culture as a silo can never survive. We have to make culture inherent, linked, inherently linked with these different sectors. And that's the only way uh, we, will, we will be able to really make uh, a headway. So this is another point that I want to highlight. We call about historic urban landscape, we call all these different approaches, but the irony is that, that though we use these terms, we are actually creating a boundary around heritage and disconnecting it from the larger context to which it belongs. And that leads me to this important point that I, I think I would conclude, and that's about the territorial planning perspective, which is so much critical to any urban development whether it's a heritage or non-heritage, and you have to actually make heritage a mainstream of that. And our planning framework in India does not recognize the diversity of this, uh, you know, uh, that is inherent in heritage because we color them red, yellow, blue, green, orange, and we make beautiful maps. And we tend to, for example, we tend to designate even archeological areas or areas which are very important for the community. Take this example in Bangalore. This is a very important uh, area for the local community. They actually go and pray there every day. It's, a, it's a just trees and some uh, stone sculptures which are uh, carved like uh, you know, snakes. And these are very important for the, the, the local cult. You know? Now in the planning framework, this is a green. And so what uh, Bangalore urban municipality decided, they decided to turn this green into what? Guess what? a parking lot because that's how green is understood that it's an open area that can be turned in and so these are the issues that we have in our cities and if we don't address them world heritage tag is not going to help i'm sorry to say that and and we need to lastly recognize urban heritage not just as a victim but there are many many examples where traditional water systems for example and this is just one practical example i wanted to show in albania can be used to fire prevention, you know. So we have to also start looking at how heritage and its heritage, as Jigda said, is not just the physical fabric, but also the community relationships that are there in the cities, no? So many urban uh, uh, um, community movements are organized around these traditional relationships. Uh, as in this case, in Georgetown, they have really done an excellent work involving community through their traditional networks. So we can use this as an asset for uh, resolving a lot of our urban issues. And we need to take these into consideration. And I conclude with this uh, program at ECROM that we are developing right now. We are actually reviving this program. This was there existing before. Uh, uh, it, was it was actually initiated by Herb Stovall. And we are uh, focusing again on this. And we wanted to, we want to really bring these four parameters together, integrated, territorial, urban, and conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you to all the panelists. Well, we now come to a, a short session. We're gonna moderate some questions. And what we're gonna do is, since there were so many provocative points made uh, in everyone's talk, uh, I think the, the, the most important thing to do as we did last time is I will curate one question, one emphatic question to each of the panelists that stood out for me. That'll give you the opportunity of sort of expanding on some points that you made. Uh, and at the end of it, we'll open it up to the panelists to rebut or sort of uh, cross fertilize each other's thoughts. And then if you have time, we'll open it up to the audience. So I'd like to start with Ranaji, I'll go in order here. Ranaji, you, in my opinion, you are to me, one of the most significant, if not the most significant living scholars in Banaras today. I've had the honor of walking Banaras with you, uh, reading a lot of what you've written, much of what I know about the cities through your work. Uh, one of the things I've also known from a lot of things you've spoken about is that the sacred and the mundane aspects of the city are completely intertwined. Uh, 
Panchagoshi Yatra is 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 a is a pilgrimage route that today finds itself going through so many aspects, so many mundane parts of the city, you cannot even recognize it in some form or the other. So while most of us focus on the Ghats, there are numerous other nuances in the city that are not easily cognizable by uh, the common man, the tourist. People like you, priests, others uh, uh, understand this. My point is one of the things I learned from my conversations with you is there are many Banarasis, depending on whom you speak to. You speak to a rickshawala, you speak to a hermit, you speak to a sadhu, you speak to a, a professor such as yourself. Uh, and, and there are completely contradictory opinions about what this city means. Uh, there are people who are fed up of the housing shortage, the social oppression and the gridlocks. There are others who are titillated by the Ghats and the sort of social history of Banaras. My question to you is sort of to bring this all together, not to reconcile it because that's a simplistic notion, but to sort of bring it together. I always felt that when I spoke to the municipal commissioner a long time ago, and you were there in the room sitting next to me, one of the things he said to us was how different difficult it was. He said, I put out fires. I, I, it's very difficult to, to manage and, and sort of negotiate this city. My question to you, therefore, is one of the things you highlighted is the sacred heritage of this city, the, 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 the sort of uh, not just the temples, but the, the phenomena that, uh, that, that, that happen every day, the garland sellers, the priests, the commercial activity that happens. There's a, there's a, there's a nuanced understanding that goes on in the sacred geography of Banaras that you've you've highlighted very much. In your opinion, are there methodologies and practices that can emerge from these existing catalysts, these already functioning engines that can challenge or contradict the sort of top-down mechanisms of heritage, the intellectual opinions of heritage that are now creating the landscape of so-called Banaras heritage? Is there another way of thinking about Banaras's heritage for the future? They say, okay. So simple. Go ahead, Ranaji, please. Oh, okay. So very simple thing is this: that why these happen. So that is the big thing. And I, what I feel that there is a need of proper education. Education, not in terms of knowledge, writing books, uh, etc. But it is just like you can say self awakening. What Gandhiji used to say, so jagarana. So that is very important that sacred and profane to be linked together. They are not like uh, opposition to each other. Actually, they support to each other. And that is somehow like, this is the one point. The second thing is that always we are talking, even the government policy or tourism policy, we are always highlighting Varanasi. Oh, it is going to be half of tourism. But there is nothing like tourism that is pilgrimage. It is 90% Indians are coming for pilgrimage. So we have to put that point what already in 2015 under UNESCO, this issue has been discussed. So in Western terminology, you can say religious tourism, but in our terminology, that will be pilgrimage tourism to a certain extent. Otherwise, that is pilgrimage. This is one. The second thing is always you think that something monumental and big and all these things you'll do. Then only people may realize this. It is not like this. You have to have some spiritual sense that should be based on the ancient past, what we have already that preserved history since 12th century. That has been lacked at several places, and that's how disintegration happened. Of course, they go several times contradiction, but still we are hopeful that it will meet. And what example I have cited, a little bit fraction I have mentioned, which North Corridor should be interpreted in that term, nothing like tourism. Several times I wrote to the authority, don't always try to do tourism. You ask people, you ask people coming here what they want. They say, I am coming for pilgrimage. They never say, then why not you are emphasizing that way? And that will help to generate an awakening program among the people, and that will be helpful to a certain uh, level, better level to maintain the city in that way. The so sacred and profane meeting together and that makes something integrated our holistic approach on the development. Thank you, Ranaji. We'll come back to you later. I'll move on to Amita. Amita uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Vinay. Um, Rohit needs to leave for a meeting, so if you can address uh, him first. And... Sure, Rohit, we, we can do that. Uh, let me move on here. So Rohit, are you there? Yes. Right. Clearly, that was a very provocative talk. 
I know that was your intention. You certainly succeeded in making it provocative. So the, the thing that stood out to me was the, the highlighting of the apparent tension between, you know, for example, something as simple as land use planning and heritage, which is a cliche, right? I mean, it continues to happen. Uh, or the tension between ecology and heritage, et cetera, et cetera. So my question to you is at the end of the day, uh, are the tags really flawed? I mean, is there a way for us to indigenize these tags? Uh, you know, World Heritage is a designation that comes from 20,000 miles away and parachutes down into cities. But the fact is, uh, city is a very difficult word. It, it morphs across terrains, political geographies, governance geographies, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly in India itself, I would argue, from north, south, east, and west, cities are not the same at all. So is there a way for us to sort of uh, counteract this parachute and really begin to indigenize this in a way, as you at least suggested to me, uh, in, in trying to do something that can root it to the realities of India? Yes, Vinayak. I mean, uh, I think the problem lies that we are uh, addressing things from the wrong side. Uh, if you get a designation from, from globally, uh, what have you done locally to receive that tag from the global, uh, you know, mandate? This is where the problem lies. And I know that sometimes, and I, I know Shika will agree with me, sometimes we push for World Heritage Tag, not for the World Heritage Tag, but because we want local action to happen, because when the World Heritage Tag comes, we will be uh, you know, there will be much more awareness and realization that something should be done locally. So I think uh, that way we have to see uh, that whatever tag comes, doesn't come, is one thing which is, uh, which has a role to play in a certain way, but it will not succeed if we also don't action from bottom up. You know, and that action from bottom up has to happen at various levels. It has to happen at the community level, of course, it has to happen at the local municipality level. Our urban local bodies have to have much more stronger role to play where heritage is mainstream. Just making a heritage cell is not going to resolve the problem. Uh, it is going to again create another siloed kind of a room for heritage, but it's not going to in any ways make much difference unless this is really integrated in a much more holistic way at the municipal level. I mean, that's where even if we do training for urban local bodies, they have to be not only for heritage people, it has to also be for other sectors, you know, that's, that's really critical. So uh, my response will be, we have to put our act together and we have to understand what does it mean to mainstream heritage in urban development? And then what do we do in order to create tools, instruments, uh, policies, plans, and uh, operational systems that can make that happen. Uh, if that doesn't happen, these tags can come. Uh, of course, they will achieve limited success in whatever way it can become trophies for us. I mean, I should not say it as a, because officially I'm supposed to be an advisory body representative, but this is a fact. I mean, uh, uh, this has to be really addressed from uh, both ends. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you for being with us tonight. So I'm gonna move on to Amita. Amita, one of the things uh, that that I one of the things I would like to ask you is uh, the, the world of uh, the practice of conservation across the world, uh, thanks to efforts by you and others in India, and now the whole world is sort of talking about this. Is uh, you know sort of shifting from the supra professional. You know, it's it's sort of no longer the domain of the sort of privileged expert alone. And now numerous other agencies are beginning to find a very serious voice in this practice. And I wanted to ask you this in the context of both the studies, because you mentioned a lot of implicit compromises, you know, the fact that uh, uh, you know, in the fort, for example, question of authenticity, or even in the question of Taj Mahal, a monument that finds itself trapped between a dilapidated river and a gunge that is trying to find its stake in it. So are there other agents that we could very consciously bring into the normative praxis of conservation in India? Thank you, thank you, Vinayak. I think what I um, firmly believe and I have for the longest time is that conservation really is the management of change. It's not about how beautifully you fix a building. That's almost the easiest part of it. It's how do you navigate the changes that are inevitable, they are implicit in a country that is developing. Um, 
you know, uh, Professor Singh was, Rana Singh was talking about Banaras. Well, Banaras built fabric is no more than 300 years old. It's continuously reconstructed. It's Banaras' culture that's thousands of years old. And I think learning to navigate that, that it's not just always in the sculpture and the stone, but the life around it and the reconnecting the life to the stone. Um, you know, for years, there was a proposal to make Agra a World Heritage City. If Jesselmeyer made it, Agra didn't, because we haven't been able to have that convergence of making it a planning, economic, political, and social undertaking. And I think that going forward, if we want HUL and other elements to succeed, it's not about making it more beautiful. It's about making it work for the inhabitants of the city who live there. I mean, I don't know how many citizens in Ahmedabad or Jaipur have been asked whether World Heritage has benefited them. So I think those are the questions we need to ask going forward. So Amita, uh, Amita what you're essentially saying, if I'm putting words in your mouth, is the, the, the agency of multiple disciplines can like essentially form a much more complete picture on what we call heritage and conservation. Am I understanding yes, I correctly? Think, I think if we don't manage change, we're not going to succeed in conservation. Thank you. Very good. Pratish, um, brilliant work, of course. We know we know this university and it's such an inspiring project. Kudos again from in public and on record. Uh, so two questions and they converge into sort of one point. Uh, you know, while the conservation of monuments results, as you brilliantly showed, uh, sort of uh, a, a wonderful incentive to conserve public space, right? I mean, the gardens, the, the, the incredible lungs of the city, that's an amazing thing. Uh, and in the process, e ecological issues too, because you're talking about planting a new forest, for example, and all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, first question, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you have mechanisms in place that ensure that these kind of massive investments and good investments and brilliant work results in seamless local usage than making these projects exclusive. Because you know there have been numerous examples uh, and I wanted this you to enlighten the audience where conservation has often resulted in exclusiveness where now the place becomes the domain of the few rather than everyone. And the second one, which is related, is uh, we've often found cases all over the world where, I mean, the Kanats in Iran is a perfect example. In Kanats in Aleppo is an even better example. Uh, they were repaired uh, by you know, some great scholars wonderfully years ago. And when they returned two or three years later, they found that because of local clashes between the clans, uh, if all the work that they had done had sort of gone haywire and the legacy of what they'd proposed had gone uh, gone wrong. So do you have monitoring mechanisms in place in, uh, to, to make sure that the legacy of this incredible work you have done with your team is going to be continued, safeguarded, and consistent? Yes, yeah, so um, the plan is that, um, you know, um, as soon as this is finished, I head off to Kailash Parvat and not see anything that's ever happening here thereafter. <laughs> So uh, on a serious note, you know, in Delhi, we were really trying to address three major issues. One is the conservation of the monuments. Uh, the other is the social economic conditions and the, and the associated projects in health, sanitation, and so on. And the third is the development of this new city park, uh, which is Sundar Nasri. Now, um, uh, you know, one of our clause one in our MOU, which we signed in uh, gosh, uh, 2007, uh, is about the post-project sustainability. And as you can imagine, we've learned it the hard way. Uh, one of our first projects ever in Spain uh, was done for the municipality, I think, in Barcelona. And within six months of uh, having finished it, His Highness was requested to come back in and put it all over again. Um, so that was a lesson learned. So we've spent actually a lot of the last 10 years uh, while doing this project to plan for what is happening after we go. Um, with the monuments uh, and the conservation of the national monuments, we are very clear the Archaeological Survey of India has the resources and the, with the minimal maintenance of just the water spouts before the monsoons and so on, it'll be fine. So 
we've we've not really ex, uh, you know gone into i mean from our experience earlier at the garden restoration and all that these ksi has a systems in place to keep these going uh, what has been of great concern to us is the community functions and uh, sundar nursery and the creation of the city park so for the community uh, and and mind you i mean what you're saying when i is probably more challenging than the implementation of the project has been now as um, as uh, you know as uh, somebody i think kai mentioned that uh, these communities are not homogeneous and for for outsiders everybody thinks oh these 25000 people they're all muslims they're all the same well nothing could be further from the truth uh, there are factions and factions and factions and you know it's incredible there are about 15 different rwas registered in this small community of resident welfare association so for conservation for ensuring sustainability of the work we've done uh, we've we've uh, reached far because the team implementing the project in nizamuddin basti over the last 10 years 12 13 years has gone from 100% uh, non nizamuddin residents to now 100% nizamuddin residents and this is not charity these are people who have been trained to become you know experts in different fields so the team implementing the project is all now 100% residential in nizam now what we're also doing over the last couple of years and we're trying to fundraise for that is set up a community group that is like umbrella organization of several self help groups that we create and um, and this is this is a long shot but the amount of investment gone into that to make sure the toilets the health clinic the school the parent teacher association the community teachers the street improvement continues um i think uh, we we putting in a lot of effort uh, into empowering the local community making them realize of what the potential is so watch this space in sundar nursery we we took 9 years to get ministry of law ministry of home ministry of external affairs ministry of finance ministry of culture ministry of urban development and the prime minister's office approval to create a management trust uh, which is now operational for you know it will be operational in perpetuity we will take care of it for 5 years to get financial sustainability and put in management system that's on the nursery this was absolutely critical because uh to design it and build it is one way but to make sure it is used in the way that it was designed uh, is another way altogether so over the last couple of years we've been innovating organic markets uh, organic farms uh, e programs cultural programs and so on it's been really handicapped with covid but uh, you know we've had 300000 visitors last year and and what is very critical is going to be visit of and as part and, and you know with all these monuments now world heritage it gives us an opportunity to really do a proper management plan that can be implemented in perpetuity excellent thank you very good kai i'm going to move to you uh hi vinay uh, shikhar so oh shikhar is there yes uh, oh, there's a very busy I people and that is a weekend i mean come on <laughs> okay shikhar let's move on to you um all right sorry kai taking your turn <laughs> so shika again we've known a lot about your work uh, you know it's nice to see it again uh, so the the question i feel is rather direct i think what advertent or inadvertent damage does a designation do to an indian city because it is a designation that was born in the crucible of the west and we cannot deny that So if you could just address this very clearly, you know that would be wonderful. Uh, so that's I mean it may take some time to address, but I'll try to be very brief, uh, Vinaya. Um, what uh, what uh, positives from the inscription, like Rohit just mentioned, you know, just before it is getting inscribed or when we are walking towards its inscription, if it's tentative list or other, uh, you know, the final inscription. Between that, we can do so much. because all the government bodies are just ready to commit you know to any government legislation heritage legislation protection or you know mobilize things on ground for this so that i would say is the time and and you know as an expert who done world heritage several times i try to use that 
you know, particular slot to get maximum commitments out of the government, which could be long term or, or even establishing system. Like when we first did it for Jantar Mantar, that is one, uh, you know, good example where I see the system working even today. Uh, of course, it gets very challenging in terms of, uh, you know, cities because they are more complex and more layered. And that is something I see uh, an issue with both Jaipur and Ahmedabad that post inscription, they are, you know, sort of uh, losing, uh, you know, out on their commitments to World Heritage uh, Committee that they give. Uh, and uh, it's because also because the government officials keep changing, you know. So while people, when they were during inscription, they know the commitment and they know what is to be followed. The officials keep changing and then nobody has a clue what is World Heritage, what they committed to. And, you know, there's no institutional memory, which becomes a major issue. Um, another point I just wanted to mention, I think it is also there. And also when ICOMOS experts visited, or I think it's sort of set in Western uh, notion that if we get World Heritage inscription, we may have issues of gentrification which I don't find that Indian cities have any, you know, fear of that. It may happen in certain pockets, like it did in Hoskars in Delhi or maybe in Mumbai, but I know Jaipur, like we did a social survey and to our surprise, we found out that the city or economy of the wall city is not dependent on tourism. The residents themselves, you know, there is uh, responded to that saying it's the local economy. They are not bothered whether the tourists come, they feel they just come for Jantar Mantar or the city palace. You know, all these shops sustain because the local uh, uh, people from Jaipur, even the extended Jaipur, actually come and buy stuff from them. So that is good to know that our cities are self-sustainable. I think just the larger awareness would help. Uh, for me, you know, the best achievement I felt after getting Jaipur inscribed was I got a call from a resident who said thank you, you know, for getting our city inscribed. And I have this historic, uh, you know, a sort of a, a book or manuscript that he wanted to give to me. And, you know, he especially called and said that we really feel good and thank you for getting our city inscribed. So that sense of pride, if we can instill in all the citizens, you know, then we don't need to be dependent on whether the government official is changed, whether they are following, it's the people themselves who could help us in maintaining that particular tag. And the tag is, I mean, for me, it's just a tool, you know, to make the city work. Like uh, Rohit said, I'm not really concerned about getting that brand or UNESCO. Jaipur had enough international visibility even before with the literature festival and all. The only reason we focused on the inscription was so that it becomes a tool for managing and protecting the heritage. Thank you, Shika. Very good. Well said. Enjoy your day. Kai, I'm going to move to you now. Uh, you know, there are, now you're a scholar, obviously, you said you were doing your PhD in this subject. Um, you know, there is a lot of continuing commentary about designations and principles about what conservation and heritage ought to be. We all love to talk about ought to be's, right? That's pretty convenient for all of us. My question to you, just to extend the point Shikha made just now is, Kai, how do you think, particularly in India, since you worked in Kathmandu, South Asia, and Asian places, particularly the non-West, can heritage and conservation be made anti-intellectual so that it becomes a, a, uh, an aspect that is genuinely of interest to the common man? Um, yes, I think uh, we have intellectualized heritage in a certain sense that it's the elite who have the means and interest to protect or conserve heritage. Uh, it's uh, sort of something that you do, um, you know, with your extra money and uh, it's sort of a hobby. Uh, so in many places you do see, uh, you know, uh, heritage being supported. You know, you can either support uh, the, the the poor, needy people, or then heritage because they sort of are put into the same bracket. Um, it's I believe because we have defined it as being such, we've sort of removed it out of its context and saying, oh, this is heritage. 
when you actually, uh, you know, heritage, uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, is, is sort of the basis for how we live. Now, uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, I linked it also to questioning why cultural heritage isn't mentioned sort of with the SDGs and, you know, it's, it's that whole approach of where we say we, we approach development or generally uh, in projects. Uh, you know, we have a certain goal, we implement it, uh, and that's sort of how things are dealt with in especially South Asia. Uh, we have, uh, or then the other approach is if you look at the UN system, the ones with the most money are those that go in after emergencies, world program, you go and feed the people, uh, you know, and then what about sustainability? Uh, well, feeding millions of people just like that is not sustainable. Now, how, what are we going to actually do about making this sustainable? That's the boring part. That's not something that's going to be funded. And, you know, this sort of approach to continuity, you know, we, and I think, again, the whole discussion of conservation, we need to try to change our approach. It's not conservation, it's how do we ensure some kind of continuity of that which is important. Uh, there will be change, it has to adapt, and that is done by the communities themselves. And, you know, whether we give the World Heritage Tag or not, uh, as you know, Shikha was saying, it's, it's a tool, it's political, it's, you know, we say, oh, wow, how many, you know, your country, how many World Heritage sites do you have? Uh, you know, that's it. Once it's on the site, yes, we have it, and it's great. But how are we actually going to bring that down to the communities? And one of the things that I've just been trying to work on is also with the communities, that heritage, uh, the World Heritage Tag, how can they profit from it? You know, is there some, you know, putting labels on their products? Is it, you know, is it something that can be marketed for the communities, uh, linking it to the sites? Uh, it has to be worked on at that level and not, uh, you know, whether the World Heritage Committee uh, likes a development project or not. And that's far beyond the communities. I mean, it's, it's something that is, uh, you know, at, at a totally different level. And I think we really have to work on, on bringing that community in the middle and having them decide what is valuable and how we move forward. Yes, so I think, you know, that community aspect. And as Ratish was saying, you know, it is, the community is not just a, a, a sort of an entity, uh, we have to look at it much more in detail. It's diverse. Each individual has their own, you know, inspirations, and we have to look at it at that level. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, uh, Dennis. I'm going to move to you. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, you, you, you have the unique position of being, you know, the sort of uh, honorary outsider who's looking at this thing from a from a very different perspective, but, but. To sort of bring your presentation down from a heritage aspect to slightly shift it into another related territory, which is clearly the tension between modernism and modern architecture and uh, the traditional city. And I think this uh, was at least quite clear at, in, in some of the slides you showed. And this is this is an issue that has plagued India for almost two generations now, and I would call it a plague because I've, I've myself felt, uh, having grown up in India for the first half of my life, uh, you know that we were we were uh, we were led down a false path by people who were so convincing that it seemed like they could do no wrong, and and the legacy of modern architecture in India created a hell lot of damage and destroyed a hell lot of wonderful things in our own incredible country. So my question to you is in a regulated society, not a complex, you know, more ambiguous, murky administrative structure like we may have in India and other parts of South Asia in a highly regulated society uh, such as Liverpool, uh, what processes, what negotiations, what tensions have actually allowed or perpetrated this uh, stage where modernism, modern architecture and the traditional city are really colliding and clashing into each other in ways that are having some pretty serious repercussions on the future of the city. Well, I would like to pick up and I 
I can't remember which of the ladies was saying it earlier, but I would like to pick up on the notion that we're talking about management of change. I don't go along that line. We should be focusing on management of continuity, not of which change is a function, but continuity is the core piece. And basically you are inheriting from um, Western principles by which I include the Borough Charter, which is Australia, but that's um, Global North. And you're, you're taking principles from outside and then transposing them into the Indian situation, which I'm, I, I, I'm not connected with. Um, and so management of continuity to me is far more important than manage, management of change. And then I would, um, and I use the word deliberately blame, um, the English text of the 1964 Venice Charter, not the original French text. Article, I think it's Article 9 of the Venice Charter insists on interventions being contemporary and being uh, different. This is not what the French text original says. And then you have um, the 1933 Charter of Athens, the one that Le Corbusier um, took over, which insists on things being different and change. And then you have even worse, the 2005 Vienna Memorandum, uh, which insists on uh, basically, although it says that it wants harmony, it actually insists on conflict. So you have uh, a battle within the conservation community over what is intended, what is sought. There is serious inconsistency. And this is a major problem. Now, when it comes to Liverpool, because I've been um, uh, sometimes more than a fly on the wall, but certainly I've been closely involved in everything that's happened in Liverpool since the millennium, um, the actual process of the nomination, um, and uh, fully aware of the 2006 reactive monitoring mission and the 2011 mon reactive mon monitoring mission. The focal point for the 2006 um, mission was the uh, design um, and construction, uh, which I think took, off, took place afterwards, of the Museum of Liverpool and of the buildings which were on Man Island. Even the architect of the Museum of Liverpool building said that it was in the wrong place in the wrong place. It's right next door to the peer head group of three buildings. It's the wrong place for it. The Man Island development, which includes three black buildings of rather contorted um, morphology, are locally known as the three coffins or the three disgraces. But these conformed with the Vienna Memorandum. These were in fact endorsed because they had to follow a an international, um, uh, let me use the word edict, it's not quite right, but nevertheless I'll use it. Um, these were uh, regarded um, as being in conformity of what the international conservation community expected, namely conflictual modern buildings. And you can take the um, it's sometimes known as the slug, it's sometimes known as um, the alien, but the building in Vienna, I mean Graz in Austria. So you have a situation where, where conflicts are actually being imposed on the historic environment um, by a, um, I'll use the word, um, forgive my language, an unholy connection between modernism and conservation uh, in which difference is rather than continuity. Change, deliberately contrived change, is favored over continuity. This is a major mistake in the theory of conservation, um, which has been adopted and is still the, the, the English text of the Venice Charter is regarded as being the, the, the cornerstone of today's um, uh, conservation ethos. And there's been a very interesting that the only beneficial effect which the catastrophic fire of Notre Dame de Paris has, has been to highlight 
the uh, nonsense of the English translation of the Venice Charter um, and the uh, controversy that has arisen over the reconstruction of Villa Le Duc Spire. Um, there's even articles which I've seen in the French press in which the Ministry of Culture of France has been rebuked for not understanding the Venice Charter because he's reading the English version, not the French one. So there are major problems within the conservation community which need to be resolved. Thank um, you, Dennis. So that's it. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Jigna. Uh, you're an accomplished academic a professor, a teacher, I'm going to ask you a question, not as a practitioner, but as a professor myself. Uh, you know, as, as a member of an institution myself, the rift between architecture with a capital A and heritage conservation in the pedagogy is stark. I mean, I feel this pressure every day. I teach in numerous programs, but I can tell you, at least from where I see it, there couldn't be a bigger cleft so, you know, we're here as, as, as architects, as geographers, as, uh, as, as planners sitting here and talking about heritage, but the generic architecture programs, even in some of the best universities in the country and the world, I would argue, are pursuing a road, which is, I would argue, quite antithetical to many of the sort of more empathetic discussions that we're having here. So as an accomplished academic that is chairing and heading a major program in this country, how do you see the reconciliation of what is a scary cleft to begin with that we are staring just right in front of our face? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sabanayak. I think that's, some, that's some, I mean, as, as you are aware, that that is the most difficult question to answer. And I remember a few uh, years back, I was invited to, uh, I was a part of another discussion and uh, they had asked me a similar question that what is your what is the biggest challenge that you face as somebody who is teaching a group of arch architect graduates and um, well and that's the biggest challenge that most of them have um, have studied architecture where majority of the program uh, teaches you how to uh, erase teaches you how to uh, establish monumentality, teaches you how to, uh, I mean, it valorizes the idea of newness over what's existing and what is valuable. Rarely do uh, architecture students uh, get sites that are embedded in contexts that are very meaningful. They are considered to be, I have been part of these discussions where the tutors consider so historic sites to be too overwhelming to teach architecture uh, by taking them as sites. So if you want to take teach architecture, we should uh, look at flat plains, we should look at new sites. And that rarely, I mean, and, and, and I think that's precisely what is where the challenge lies because most of the students that we get in our first semester are the students who find it easy to erase, who find it the thought of studying a site uh, in its with its meanings and with it, with what it comes with is is rarely there. And that's the first challenge that we face. Um, I am not sure if it's possible to reconcile it the the very stark division that we see uh, without both sides opening up to the negotiation. And what I have felt so far, whether it is in uh, academia or even in practice, that uh, I think in, in the chat, Rutil Joshi, who's a planner, has asked, asked a similar question, saying that how do we? How he? I think his question is how do we now? How does heritage conservation not become a monopoly of a few? And his question is coming from the other point of view that. There are a few of us who are monopolizing the heritage conservation. And our question is that we are not getting access to the other discussion. And I think that it's it, that feeling is mutual. It's the feeling of being on the opposite end of the spectrum is mutual on both sides. And I think we are all playing to those stereotypes 
you're just repeating those stereotypes by repeating certain kind of discussion, certain kind of words, certain kind of line of opposition that we take to all the projects that come up. Uh, for example, and I, I know I'm putting my foot in my mouth when I say this big time, um, when it comes to Central Vista, we, there have been discussions that are out there in open, they are all discussed, it's, it's out there, I, I mean, there have been opposite, opposition views, personal mudslinging that has all gone into it. And when I started looking at the uh, history of Central Vista, history of the building, a lot, a lot is available about the history of the building itself, the history of Rajput, the creation of the of of the secretary uh, of the, uh, the, the it's called the North Block and the South Block and the Rashtrapati Bhavan and the Parliament Building. There's very little available about the communities that were displaced in the process of creating those buildings in the first place. And uh, if you really want to have a dialogue on conservation, they have to, a dialogue with planning, with communities, with, and if you want to break these uh, silos that we are in, and if we want to negotiate, we have to start looking at history for everything that it is, not just uh, the, build, the built part of it. The fact that those buildings also displace certain communities, and is it possible that the new project, uh, I'm not saying it erases that history, but I'm saying that uh, it somehow uh, possibly recognizes that erasure. In absence of that discussion, we are only discussing what the new buildings are erasing, rather than recognition of the erasures of the, erasures of the existing uh, buildings as well, or the erasures that heritage created. I think you spoke about how modern buildings in themselves were a series of process of erasures. So I think we need to, uh, I think everybody needs to loosen up a bit. I think everybody needs to go back to school, is what I feel sometimes. Thank you, Shikna. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to I'd like to now open this up to the panelists. You've heard each other. I, I think there are a lot of comments, uh, the brilliant comments that were made. I, I think some of you should opine on each other's opinion. Uh, I, I'd like to invite Ranaji to speak first, but Amitaji, I, I would particularly love for you uh, to talk about Dennis's comment, because the way I read your comment about change was quite different than the way, for example, Dennis uh, talked about it. So anyway, Ranaji, I'll start with you. Uh, and, we, and, and we can keep this very quick. I know we've exceeded time, but I'd like to give the panelists a little chance to say something. A very simple thing is this, in, in case of uh, like one unseen, only here it is, it is. How we are going to integrate in real sense community involvement, what we call the participatory observation. For example, only one example is here. Under the act of master plan, there is a provision that all that process and planning and procedures should be kept before the public discuss, and then you can modify, change, and try to adjust. But it never happened. Why? Is one side fault? No, both sides fault. So lack of transparency, lack of communication, lack of awakening, and that's why the whole program is going on in a different way. So when we are saying tradition and modern seem to be linked, so theoretically we also teach like this, but practically going in the field, too much. Last point, that was a big news all over. Varanshi is going to be like Toto, and when Barcelona and Santiago, my goodness, I say simple thing, leave Kasi as Kasi and make Kasi as a Kasi, nothing like Kyoto. And then a question was asked, because my Japanese connection, why not Kyoto? And they say, how a cow can be an effect? Simple thing is this, Kasi will be Kasi. People are involved there to create Kyoto. Their people are enjoying this without creating anything. So that is a big thing when you are talking. Of course, this is only unique case of the cars. I think that may be case in many holy heritage. So that is the issue I want to share. Thank you, Ranaji. Amitaji, would you like to talk and clarify your the way you talked about change? I think that's an important point. Uh, sorry, uh, Vinay. Uh, oh, she's left. Have, yeah, yeah. She's... Okay. And anybody else? All right. Anyone else wants to say any rebuttals or any sort of cross fertilizations here? Yeah. Uh, I have. I go ahead. Uh, Kai, go ahead. Um. Yeah. 
I was just interested because Dennis mentioned uh, continuity, and that's something that I've been really trying to work on, trying to understand. Uh, you know, how how do we um, change the whole approach? And uh, we have to understand that definitions of heritage has also changed. Kathmandu Valley was put on the uh, World Heritage List in 1979, and was put on the Danger List 2003 with a totally different understanding of what, uh, what was expected of this world heritage. And I think uh, you know, this uh, really needs to be discussed uh, more in detail, adapting to this changing approach and also adapting the tools and understanding. I think we're still trying to use old tools for something that's totally different. And uh, that is something that brings conflict. And like Dennis was saying, Yes, we have so many conflicts. If you go to the World Heritage Committee, we're talking about conflict, and that really needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, you had your hand up, and then Ritesh, love for you to talk. Well, I really just want to make three points. That one, urban heritage is human habitat. That seems to have got forgotten. Urban heritage has become something else. Um, and it's human habitats. That's what cities are. That's what they started for. That's the whole purpose. That's what they should be. Second one, that heritage is inheritance. Um, and we've isolated heritage into its little silo. Um, and Laura Jane Smith calls it the authorized heritage discourse, which is a very good way of summarizing it. Heritage is inheritance. Um, and that's really uh, what um, I think to me this is all about breaking down these silos, breaking down this notion that heritage is something different, breaking down the notion that, that it's a box which is only there for academics and it's only there for specialists, it's actually for everybody. Um, and to me the notion of putting a cultural heritage uh, in a silo on its own in the SDGs is wrong the intention after 2005 as the Millennium Development Goals were being developed was to embed culture across all parts of the Sustainable Development Goals. But culture is not defined in an inclusive way by academics, um, by intellectuals. It's a kind of exclusive thing. Culture in any community is what people have, what they do, what they think, and how they relate to their natural environment. It's no more complicated than that. It's not high culture, it's not low culture, it's intrinsic in everybody. Everybody has culture. Culture is not an exclusive commodity for rich people, for intellectuals. It's there, it's everywhere. Um, and it's embedded in uh, managing water, it's embedded in managing agriculture. Agriculture uses culture as part of its word. So um, what I'm looking for is inclusivity, which we do not have, and we're getting narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, and certainty and clarity uh, are absolutely essential, and consistency are absolutely essential for the management of any kind of inheritance or heritage. Um, investors like clarity, they like certainty. Give them freedom and you'll create chaos. So we've got a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Ritesh, I'd love to hear your thoughts from you. Well, I, I feel as though I'm an outsider, but thank you for inviting me. It was great, Dennis. Thank you so much. Thanks, Manaj. Uh, we all said everything we needed to say. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, I think uh, taking off from uh, what Dennis has just said, I think what is critical is, you know, often as conservationists, uh, uh, we are even in sort of uh, the upper echelons of conservation, we sort of said, involve the community in the conservation effort. And um, and that is just silly. I mean, it's our job as conservation professionals to do conservation. But our job is also there to make sure that the community benefits from the conservation. Uh, for far too long, we've been talking about involve the community as if they have nothing else to do. I mean, a lot of people in Nizamuddin are now involved in the conservation effort, but that's after they have benefited in enormous ways uh, 
as on account of the heritage they live among. And uh, and finally, I think uh, you know, for us, uh, with hindsight, why we were able to do what we've been able. To, there is still a lot else. If we had another ten years, we could probably go on, but we don't. We have just one more year. A lot will not be done. But uh, was a to get all of the different government agencies to talk to each other and sign the same piece of paper. That was the smartest thing we did. The second thing in Nizamuddin we did is because there was so much suspicion, we started that project on the back of the municipal district. The deputy commissioner of the municipality saying he was, you know, obviously less said the better, but he went around Nizamuddin saying, where there are parks, I will build buildings, and where there are buildings, I will build parks. So he had the American 1970s idea of, you know, creating vertical ghettos. Um, to keep the monument in green spaces, which is not what it was meant to be at all. Um, so on the back of that, there was a lot of suspicion. So one of the first things we did was uh, enhance the health, education, sanitation infrastructure. And it was only when opportunities came by that we were able to get involved with urban improvements, with uh, conservation and so on. So we needed all the government people to sign the same piece of paper. We needed we see ourselves as a bridge between government, donors, community, and so on. We needed an interdisciplinary team. I have about 25 different disciplines on the team. Uh, we needed, uh, we needed um, intense, um, intense dialogue with both, uh, with the community, with all the groups of the community. And then finally, we needed, we needed to raise a lot of money. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not unheard of, and a lot of what we've done can be replicated by academic institutions, by RWAs, by uh, by other NGOs. So there is hope, there is possibility. Uh, it's just not easy. Thank you, Jigna. You have your hand up. Thank you, Ritesh. Thank you, Jigna. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just kind of I wanted to extend that idea that Ritesh spoke about that communities are not. Uh, they're not available when we want to involve them and it's our job to conserve it's not the community's job i just want to extend that idea that uh, i think when we talk about community involvement uh, we take it literally from the point of view that community needs to be involved and we need to talk to the community and we need to kind of involve in all the decision making that's one part of it that is dependent on the community the community has the right to also reject the, the involvement. And there, that has happened in Ahmedabad that the community has rejected the entire idea and said, we don't want anything to do with this. So that's one part of it. I think the other part of the, it that I want to talk about from the point of view of our responsibility is that our responsibility is to identify histories of various communities that are embedded in that very layered built environment that we keep on talking about. I think the problem lies when we uh, only pick up and for the World Heritage um, nomination, we have to identify the outstanding universal value. And that makes up pick up the most glorious, the most fantastic aspect of history of the city. The other little histories that are that people live with are not going anywhere. They're not going away. And it's possible that in the process of kind of being true to the OUV, we may be erasing that. And I think that that responsibility to the community is something that is uh, th that I want to highlight, that I think that that is our, pretty much our responsibility. Whether the community wants to involve themselves or not is uh, is a question to be asked. It's, it's, it's a choice that the community makes. But to not choose to identify all those histories is a choice we make. I think that's the distinction that I would want to make. Very good, Jinda, wonderful. So I'm going to conclude with some final comments and then pass it on to Poonam. Uh, you know, I just want to remind everyone that I think it was 1902 when the St. Mark's, the Campanile in St. Mark's Piazza collapsed. And uh, many of you know this, you know, there was a heated debate in the plaza, but I, I just want to remind everyone in light of what was said, that the, the tower that we see today in St. Mark's Piazza is a replica of an original. And the reason it's a replica is because the citizens came together and they were all divided into all kinds of factions. Some of them wanted to hold an international competition. Some of them wanted to leave it as a heap of debris. But eventually the majority won and they said, damn it, you know, this 
spot with this tower is so embossed in our memory. We just want it damp, replicated. Forget all these things about authenticity. We just want it replicated. So for those of us that don't know about it, Venice is Venice today because of the power of people. They made a decision. It went a particular way. It could have just gone another way, but that's the power of people. So what I'm getting at eventually, which sort of ties all this together, it seems to me, is that there is one definition of our cities, which is the noun, which is pretty obvious to us, the buildings, the monuments, what we touch, the tangible aspect of a city. But the other definition of the city is the verb, the process through which our cities are made. And I think that is the, the, the key point that came out today in everyone's, whether it was the extraordinary work Ratish is doing in terms of design, the sort of pedagogical initiatives that Jigna is talking about, the theoretical insights that Dennis talked about, Kai talked about, you know, Ranaji's great scholarship on Banaras. I think the, the overarching theme that emerged today is the emphasis on process and people. And so perhaps the, the end, end game, the end, uh, the sort of conclusive remark for today's session is probably that none of us, absolutely none of us, no charter, no author, no scholar has all the answers. The only way we're perhaps gonna get close to it is by coming together, bringing our disciplines together and, and blurring the lines that separate practice from pedagogy, conservation from architecture, and continuing to co blur these and come together towards the common cause of keeping the city and nature together as one. Thank you so much, Poonam. I'm gonna pass it to you as always for the final word. Um, I think it's, uh, it's just really late and, and, and it's been just so engaging to, to bring this and, and also to recognize our our way of putting ourselves in silos and, and hope what we are seeing the action this time around is that people are recognizing and I don't say community because uh, commune and community but I would say residents and citizens uh, I think we also need to uh, democratize how we address our own position and we are citizens first and then maybe an architect, and then maybe a conservationist, or maybe an urbanist, or whoever. And as a citizen, to be participating in these movements is becoming the key to understand and, and to really see our own role as a facilitator is something that I seem to share with everyone's uh, presentation and perspectives. And I'm going to stop now. Kirti Ji, and thank you so very much. I'm really grateful for accepting this advice. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, this, it's very late. There's obviously no time to kind of uh, say anything more. Uh, all I want to do is to really kind of thank everyone for this absolutely stunning, brilliant dialogue. Uh, it is a huge amount of scholarship, you know, brilliance and uh, understanding that you know, you're short. Thank you very much. And I, uh, all I can do is to really kind of thank everyone personally. So thank you, Rana Saab. Thank you, Amitaji. Ji. Thank you, Ratish Bhai. Thank you, Kai. Shikha Ji, Danis, Jigna Ji, and Rohit Bhai. Uh, thank you very much you know, for this uh, enlightened uh, 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 meeting. Uh, uh, it was uh, one of the best we have in the last uh, 50 odd that we have organized. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Purnamji, as well. And thank you very much, Vinayak Saab. Uh, it was a very late there, where you are. Uh, but thank you for, for being up, and thank you for being very live. I also must take this opportunity to thank my colleague, uh, Ankisha and other colleagues, for making this possible. They worked very hard behind yeah. the scene and make this possible. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for everyone and, uh, and uh, brilliant. Bye.